My oldest son and his wife were traveling from Daytona Beach on Highway 100 towards Ocala. They were driving a work van with trailer going 60 miles per hour around 12 midnight. There were no lights on the road but their headlights illuminated a creature standing on the side of the road looking across towards the other side of the road. As they were approaching it never looked into the headlights but kept staring across the road. The description was a bipedal wolf-like creature that appeared to be predominantly bare-skinned, though there was hair on some parts of the body. They described the face as evil with visible teeth. It was very tall. My son stated that it was every bit as tall as the van he was driving. They continued on their way, praying that they would not break down. My youngest son was driving home along the same route he did every night. This was in Polk County, Florida. It was around 1.30 am. On consecutive nights, while traveling on the same stretch of road, a wolf-like creature ran in front of his car on all fours. It was huge, its back was four foot from the ground and had a large, well-developed muscular chest which tapered dramatically towards abdomen and flanks. It also had a large bushy tail. I was just reminded of an experience I had that I never told to anyone because I couldn't even explain it to myself. Don't know why I never googled it before, maybe because I thought it was too crazy, I've never ever told my husband. Anyway, it was sometime between 2001 to 2003 and I was going to school in DeKalb, Illinois and was working at a restaurant in Maple Park. I was driving home from work late one night on County Line Road, this is a really rural area no street lights, just corn and a few farms, and something flew across my windshield. I was probably going about 45 to 50 miles per hour and it was going fast enough in the opposite direction to not get hit by my car. It came close enough to the windshield to almost touch it, but I don't think it did. It was at least as long as the width of the car. There were no lights on the street so I only had the lights of the car to see. It was big and black and fast. It actually shook the car as it flew past. I literally had no idea what I had just seen. There was nothing I could think of to explain it so I mostly forgot about it. Just did a Google search on a black flying creature on a whim at 3am and came across your site among others that have reported on numerous similar sittings in the Chicago area. There was a man who mentioned in the comment section on your site that he saw it on Route 47 which is a route about a mile east of the road I saw it. While just looking on Google Maps I noticed, and never knew back then, that there is a pretty large forest preserve, Virgil Forest Preserve, that sits in between the two roads in a town called Virgil. Possibly where this thing hangs out? I guess I'm not crazy after all this thing is and was real. I don't want to sound crazy but a few years back I believe I had a sighting and just recently in 2016 I had a strange encounter which this one could have been my imagination. If nothing else I am just quite curious and have been over the years since the initial sighting which would have been around 2007 to 2008. I could pinpoint the date closer if I thought about it. I had just fallen asleep one night and awoke to see a dark figure with wings perched on top of the neighbor's roof watching me. Its eyes were red I believe, they were like a cat's eyes with its night vision. It wasn't like an owl like some have mentioned, but it was a shiny black creature with large wings and almost shiny skin or coating. This creature looked to have very muscular arms and legs. This creature had a very nice face of a man which left me wondering afterward if it was a good thing or a bad thing. It scared me to the point I moved away from the window and didn't want to look, staying awake all night. I called some friends the next day explaining what I saw, but believing it to be some sort of angel or dark creature that didn't mean well. Less than a year later I was diagnosed with cancer. I went into remission and after many years thought I had beat the cancer. The second so-called sighting of something strange and black that seemed to affect the lighting on a street lamp blinking off and on erratically happened, but I didn't see clearly enough to recognize if it was the same strange dark figure. 
Months later I was diagnosed with cancer metastasis that is terminal. I am not saying the cancer diagnosis was related to these sightings but just a strange coincidence. There have been other strange things with energies around over the years but I don't want to assume anything. Unlike other sightings I do not live in Chicago, I live in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Just wanted to reach out and try to understand this. So hoping you can shed some light on any of these ordeals if possible. It was the summer of 2002, long after midnight, and Highway 23 lay quiet under a blanket of darkness, stretching across the ridges of the Ozark Mountains. The road twisted and turned in a maze of curves, each hiding the unexpected just beyond its edge. My hands were steady on the wheel, headlights slicing through the shadows as we drove the scenic pig trail byway, only faint starlight glimmering off the dense woods around us. Beside me sat a friend, her face illuminated faintly by the glow of the dashboard as she dozed lightly, perhaps lulled by the rhythmic hum of the tires. I was wide awake, though. Years of nighttime drives had made me alert, my eyes sharp. Wildlife identification was second nature to me. I could tell a fox from a bobcat at just a glance. But that night, something else awaited us on the road. The road took another left bend, and I eased up on the gas, eyes trained on the next curve. That's when I saw it. Just past the start of the curve, a massive, dark figure stood dead center in the middle of the road. I hit the brakes instinctively, heart pounding as I tried to process what I was seeing. The creature stood stock still, facing me, framed by my headlights like some silent sentry. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Towering, at least eight or nine feet tall, with long, matted hair covering its bulky frame. It was hunched slightly, knees bent, but its upper body stood upright, rigid, as though locked in an eerie stance of attention. I took in the bulk of its torso and limbs, which, though large, lacked the kind of muscle definition I would expect on a bear or some other large animal. No, this creature was different. A strange mix of primal strength and unnerving stillness. And even from this distance, I could tell it wasn't just another animal wandering the highway. For a long moment, it stared right back at me, frozen. My headlights washed over it, highlighting the long strands of hair and the broad, human-like head. Though it was too far to make out any facial details. A jolt of panic shot through me, I felt as though I were staring at something I shouldn't be seeing, something that shouldn't be there at all. Just as quickly as it had appeared, the creature moved. In a flash, it spun on its heel and sprinted, angling off the road toward the slope on the inside of the curve. Its speed was mind-bending, almost unnatural, and its movements eerily smooth as it dashed away from the road. I barely managed to mutter, did you see that? My friend stirred, lifting her head in confusion. See what? She mumbled, squinting toward the darkness ahead. She leaned forward, but by then, it was already gone. I pushed the accelerator, chasing after where it had vanished, a desperation to see it again thrumming in my veins. As we neared the curve, I noticed the steep road cut. A jagged rise of loose shale and sandstone, running along the inside of the bend for at least 30 yards. I slowed down, scanning the slope, fully expecting to see the creature scaling the rocks or moving along the ridge. But there was nothing. Just the bare, stark cliff face, towering over the road. I squinted, certain I'd catch a glimpse of it further up, moving through the trees. But all I found was silence, an empty road. I felt an eerie prickle down my spine. It had been seconds. Mere seconds. Since the creature left the road. There was no possible way for anything that large to vanish into thin air. And yet, that's exactly what had happened. I glanced at my friend, who looked back at me with a mix of disbelief and impatience, no doubt wondering if I'd imagine the whole thing. But I knew what I saw. I let the car crawl along the edge refusing to give up, still hoping to see any sign of the creature, a stray footprint, a snapped branch. But it was as though the forest had swallowed it whole. I spent the rest of the drive home in silence, 
my mind looping back to that shadowy figure and the speed at which it had disappeared. It wasn't until days later, as I turned the incident over in my head, that the answer dawned on me like a slap to the face. There was a ditch along the road cut, an unseen crevice that ran along the base of the cliff. That's where it had gone. That creature hadn't scaled the rocky bank at all. It had dropped into the ditch, vanishing from sight before I could reach it. My hands shook just thinking about it, a wave of cold disbelief washing over me. The sighting haunted me, pricking at memories of a conversation from years earlier. I remembered a friend's story about strange creatures rumored to roam these woods, hidden away in the depths of the Ozark wilderness. They'd laughed it off, chalking it up to tails spun in the dark, but I could never quite shake the sense that those stories held a grain of truth. And now, after seeing that creature, I was certain. I spoke of it to almost no one, unwilling to face the ridicule or skepticism I knew would follow. But I couldn't forget. Every time I returned to those roads, the memory resurfaced, as vivid as the night I'd seen it. Now, I drive slower, my eyes scanning the edges of the curves, half hoping, half dreading I might catch sight of it again. But some things, I've learned, are better left unseen. I want to tell you about a creature I've seen twice. This is about four years ago. I went to work about two o'clock in the morning and on the far out reaches my of headlights, I seen this thing crawl across the road and I thought, well, you know, my eyes were playing tricks on me. I just barely could see it because it was way out, you know, from my my headlights, so I just kind of blew it off. I just thought, well, you know, I just seen something weird. It crawled really weird and what I seen just didn't make any sense. So then about a year later, I was going to work again and it jumped out of the weeds. There was like three foot high weeds on the side of the road and it jumped out. Right at the edge of my car, like, it was, it didn't jump out like it was going to run across the road, it jumped out like it was going to attack whatever came by. And it was. This is what part's gonna sound weird. The bottom half of it was like a spider and the top half of it was like a monkey and it was like two and a half foot tall. Have you guys ever heard of anything so crazy like that? I was taking my usual, evening walk and witnessed a jet black entity run from the woods, across the street, and what I assumed to be down a cul-de-sac. The entity ran below a street light, but had no reflection, like Fantablack, I think that's how you spell it, color. I expected to see a rippling of clothing, but I couldn't see any clothing bulges. Imagine the male figure on bathroom signs, that is essentially what it looked like as it ran across the road. It also had bad running form, instead of keeping the arms tight and proper, this entity kind of flailed its arms about as it ran. I hey arm motions were certainly exaggerated. As I approached the area, I hyped myself up and passed the cross section of road, but there was no one in sight. In the kitchen at 11.50 PM making sleep tea. Looked out the window in the back door and saw a deer-like animal about 10 feet from the door. Its body was barrel shaped, posts set on legs, body to long for normal deer, to tall and head moved up and down, left and right. No movement to the ears. Have watched a doe with her fawn for past six weeks eating plants in my flower garden. This night the doe and fawn went flying in full panic mode between the swing set and this other deer. This animal just watched it fly by and looked back at me. Normal deer would have followed these two and not have just stood there. I have jumped deer walking and watched them flee. This doe and fawn were just a flash. Would like you to know that I have selected sires for a dairy herd for over 20 years and know how to judge an animal's appearance. We have had up to 8 deer outside the house during the winter months. This one was not normal in any regard. The next thing I see are two black eyes in front of my face, turned to leave the door and felt cold air on my back. Did not fully make the turn 
was still bring by left foot forward when the eyes were in front of me again. I could not move and did not want it in my house. Could feel heat on top of my head that grew more intense along with the feeling of complete and total peace. Tranquility, but did not want it there, but it felt so good I was no longer able to stop it from happening. Next thing I know I'm standing about 5 foot from the door with my house coat tied all bunched up at my waist feeling disoriented and like something is wrong, not right. When I checked the time it was 3.38 am the next morning. And the morning woke up with a small round scab on top my head with dry, totally dehydrated blood to the nape of my neck and a small lump on my head. By night there were small welts on my lower legs. These went away within 12 hours and new ones would come. This went on for two to two a half week and itched like crazy. Used all kind of lotions, nothing total took the itching away. Growing up in the Ozark Mountains, I learned to appreciate the wilderness from a young age. The trees spoke secrets in the wind, and the trails wove a web of adventure through the steep, rugged terrain. Between the settlement of Low Gap and Hickory Grove Church, where Cat Holler carved its way through the land, I spent countless hours hunting, exploring, and napping under the shade of towering oaks. On one particularly hot summer day in 2002, I settled onto the couch for a midday nap. My siblings had gone on a hike to an old, unoccupied house down the mountain, and I was grateful for the silence. The world faded away, replaced by the soothing hum of the ceiling fan and the gentle rustling of leaves outside. Little did I know that my peaceful slumber would be shattered soon. I awoke to the sound of excited voices and the sharp poke of fingers prodding my shoulder. My brother and two sisters burst through the door, panting, their faces flushed with the thrill of discovery. You won't believe what we saw. My brother exclaimed, practically jumping with excitement. I blinked away sleep, confusion swirling in my mind. What are you talking about? They shared wild tales of their hike, claiming they had spotted an ape-like creature near the old house. I scoffed, irritation bubbling up inside me. You're kidding, right? An ape? In the Ozarks? It was huge. My sister chimed in, her eyes wide. It looked just like a gorilla. I grumbled and shoved the blanket aside. If you're just trying to mess with me, it's not funny. I was sleeping. But they insisted, their enthusiasm only fueling my frustration. After a heated exchange, they finally convinced me to join them the following day. I was reluctant but didn't want to be the odd one out, after all, the mountains were calling and my curiosity was piqued. The next morning, we set off early, the sun casting a warm glow over the rugged landscape. The path down to the house was steep and treacherous, a winding ribbon through the thick woods. My siblings chattered excitedly, recounting every detail of their encounter as we descended. By the time we arrived at the old house, I was grumpy and skeptical. We fanned out, exploring the dusty rooms and the overgrown yard but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. See? I said, frustration seeping into my voice. You've dragged me all the way down here for nothing. I turned to give them a piece of my mind, but they only shrugged it off, determined to find something to validate their story. After scouring the place and finding nothing unusual, I threw my hands up in defeat. This is ridiculous. I can't believe you made me walk all this way for a ghost story. I turned to march back up the mountain, my siblings trailing behind, their chatter subdued. About 300 yards from the house, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Brother, do you still think we're lying? My older sister asked, a hint of amusement in her voice. Absolutely. I replied without looking back, still agitated. Look on the porch, she urged, and I paused mid-step, curiosity flaring. I turned and my breath caught in my throat. There it was. Standing on the porch of the old house was a small black creature, swaying slightly, almost as if it were watching us leave. Its coal black hair glistened in the sunlight, the shine contrasting sharply with its lighter colored face. I could hardly comprehend what I was seeing. It looked like a chimpanzee but stood on two feet, its arms dangling in front of its body, slightly slouched, 
as if it were merely observing us with innocent curiosity. For a few seconds, none of us moved. We stood frozen, staring at this unexpected visitor, and then, without warning, fear surged through me. My heart raced, my instinct screaming at me to run. Run, I shouted, the panic in my voice echoing through the holler. We bolted, scrambling back up the mountain, hearts pounding in our chests, adrenaline propelling us faster than we had ever run before. As we reached the top of the ridge, breathless and wide-eyed, I turned to my siblings, who looked just as stunned as I felt. Did we really just see that? I gasped, still trying to process the surreal encounter. I told you we weren't lying. My sister exclaimed, laughing nervously, still trying to catch her breath. I was still shaking, an odd mix of fear and exhilaration coursing through me. I had lived in these mountains my whole life, and never had I encountered anything like that. As we walked back home, the reality of what we had seen began to sink in. We had glimpsed something extraordinary, something that didn't belong in the realm of the mundane. The Ozarks had always held secrets, but this one was different. Tangible and wild, lurking just beyond the edge of our understanding. In the days that followed, I couldn't shake the memory of that creature from my mind. I found myself drawn back to the old house, the porch where I'd seen the creature standing so innocently. We returned multiple times, searching for evidence, but the creature remained elusive, slipping into the shadows of the woods like a ghost. The experience sparked a curiosity that I hadn't felt in years. I dove into books about the folklore of the Ozarks, tales of mysterious creatures and ancient legends. I learned that Cat Holler and its surrounding hollows were filled with stories. Whispers of beings that walked upright and hid in the depths of the mountains. I shared my story with friends and neighbors, and while some laughed, others nodded knowingly, recounting their own strange encounters. Years passed, but I never forgot that day in Cat Holler. The mountains held mysteries, and now I was a part of them. I found myself exploring deeper into the woods, searching for the unseen, the unexplained. Each rustle of leaves and snap of a twig sent a thrill through me. A reminder that the wild world was full of surprises. Now, I understood that sometimes, the beauty of nature lay in its secrets. The mountains would always call to me, offering adventure and enigma in equal measure. And every time I ventured out, I'd carry the memory of that small, black creature with me, a reminder that some stories are waiting to be told, just beyond the edge of the known. I have German Shepherd. I have two German Shepherds. One that stays in the yard and one I put on a run. So every night I would take my dog for a walk because I felt bad because he wasn't getting any attention and there's a five day period, I would take him for a walk and one night. I have a couple of acres of property in Pittsburgh, but our back road is very desolate. One night I was walking him and he just did not want to walk and he actually stepped in front of me and did not want to go any further. Okay, we walk about two miles. So we come home that night and next night nothing happened. The following night, after that, he did the same thing. He stepped in front of me and, like, it's really weird, you know, he wouldn't let me walk. All the way he turned around and looked over his shoulder behind him, like someone was behind us, and, like, I'm looking. Okay, he was a German Shepherd. He has a high prey drive. If we see a deer back there, he'll bark, you'll know. He just didn't. He was acting weird. A couple nights later, we walk up this road and he does the same thing. As we're walking back down the road, I see this thing come across the road that's black. It stops in the middle of the road and my hair stood up on my body. Straight up. It was black, like a shadow. There was no eyes. There was no nothing. I stood there. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. And my dog's looking at it and I'm looking at it and it was about 15 seconds, maybe. The funny part was, I couldn't get him past that spot. I had to drag him home. I got back and my wife and I have a fire pit, and I got back, I was shaking. I'll be honest with you. I didn't believe in ghosts. I didn't believe in anything. I'm like a real guy. 
But that thing scared the SHT out of me. I routinely check my surveillance cameras at my other home when I go there at least once a month. I do this to see if anyone was around my house when I'm not there. The motion sensor lights are activated when something walks by and usually it's coyotes or raccoons. So when I went down to my home in Bewers on November 6th and was playing back the videos recorded by my surveillance cameras. I noticed a strange image in one of the videos for camera 3 on the night of November 4th. I checked the videos that were recorded earlier that night and found the one where the entity appeared. It seemed to fly into the area just in front of camera 3 and attach somehow to the overhang of the roof. The thing was glowing and moving from time to time. It was visible from a little after 6 pm on the 4th of November until the next morning just at daylight. It was to the side of the camera so I could not see a better picture of it. I checked the videos for the night of the 5th of November and the entity came back but was in front of camera 4. It appeared a little after 7 pm. It was glowing real bright and moving around. It stayed in that area from what I could tell on the video till about 9.30 pm. I checked all the videos going back till the middle of October and did not see it in any of those. In the videos you can see geckos crawling about on the soffit behind the thing. I have no idea of what it was but sure was not an animal since it had the ability to glow brightly. It looked like something not of this earth and is the reason I am reporting it. For your information, Bewers is located about 60 miles south of New Orleans close to the mouth of the Mississippi River. This story is from the later part of 2000. Tony grew up in the Chicago area and in his early 20s he attended the Chicago Job Corps School to advance his knowledge in the trades. The campus is off of Kedzie Avenue and the property is bordered by a tributary river. It was a sunny midday when Tony and a friend were having a cigarette and facing the river when they noticed a large shadow gliding over the ground. He felt it to be odd but didn't pay much attention to what it since neither one looked up to see what it was. It was just a few moments later when both witnesses saw a large creature flying very close to the water surface of the river. Tony made first note of how odd this bird was because he thought it was a large tropical species. He was taken back as the bird drew closer. It was a murky green color. With scales on the body, but feathered wings. He stated that it had a very long tail, like a snake, with a small tufted feather on the tip. This creature landed approximately 30 feet away from the two men when it began to use the claws on the leading edge of the wing to crawl up a small dirt rise. Tony mentioned that it truly reminded him of a prehistoric monster seen in books. This animal made it way to the top of a drain inlet where it had climbed inside. Tony's friend began to yell profanities and throw small rocks at the beast to try to draw it back out, but Tony cautioned him not to do that because this encounter scared him and he had no idea of what this thing could do to them if it came to attack. Tony estimated the wingspan to be 5 feet and the body to be between 5 to 6 feet. This brief encounter left him stunned and very upset. He insisted that he never once see this creature ever again. The illustration is what I found that Tony says looks very close to what he saw. The drawing is what Tony did to illustrate how he saw the bird. The chill of the overcast sky seeped into my bones as I drove my old pickup truck along the familiar stretch of highway that ran beside the river bottoms. Years of experience had taught me to appreciate the cold. It was just part of the rhythm of life here in the heart of the Ozarks. The bottoms were wild and unpredictable, yet I felt a strange comfort in their chaotic beauty. I had hunted these lands since I was a boy, learning the patterns of deer and bear, soaking in the silence punctuated only by the rustle of leaves and the occasional call of a distant crow. Despite my years of experience, I had never encountered anything I couldn't identify. Until today, I glanced over at my longtime friend, Earl, who sat in the passenger seat, a familiar presence on many of my expeditions. We were on our way to check on the cattle at my ranch, 
a few miles up the road. As we approached the utility right of way that crossed the highway, I instinctively pulled over to the shoulder, my old habit of scanning for wildlife kicking in. Mind if we take a quick look? I asked, knowing Earl wouldn't object. Not at all, he replied, his eyes already darting to the trees. The land on either side of the highway had changed over the years, but the river bottoms remained largely the same. Mysterious, unyielding, and beautiful in their wildness. Old-growth hardwood forests that had once flourished here were mostly gone now, harvested for timber, leaving behind swamps and oxbow lakes filled with life. I had fished and hunted here so often that the sights, sounds, and smells felt like an extension of myself. It was a place where I felt connected to the land, where the whispers of the wind carried stories of the past. Earl and I settled into the truck, watching the right of way for any signs of movement. Minutes passed, the world outside painted in muted grays. I glanced at my watch, just as I noticed a flicker of motion along the timber line on the north side of the right of way. At first, I thought it was a human, maybe someone hiking away from the highway. But the figure was too tall much taller than any man I had ever seen. Earl, take a look at that, I said, nodding toward the movement. Earl squinted, focusing on the distant figure as I rummaged for my binoculars. I handed them over, my heart beating faster with a mix of curiosity and caution. As I observed from the passenger seat, I could see the figure moving along the tree line. It walked on two legs, its gait oddly fluid, but something about it didn't sit right. It was just too tall, too. Unnatural. I fumbled around in the cab for my rifle, feeling the weight of anticipation settle over me. Is it a person? Earl asked, his voice low. I don't think so, I replied, finally pulling the rifle from its case. It's bigger than any man. With the 24 times rangefinder scope aimed at the figure, I steadied my breath. The sight filled with detail. The creature was covered in a burnt brown, stringy-looking hair. I could see its massive shoulders tapering down to a narrow waist. Its arms swung in long arcs, almost comically large in comparison to its body. Holy hell, I whispered, my fingers tightening around the rifle. What in the world is that? Earl grabbed the binoculars back from me, his eyes wide with disbelief. What is it carrying? I adjusted my grip on the rifle peering through the scope once more. There it was, unmistakably. What appeared to be the body of a small hog slung over its right shoulder, held by the feet with its right hand. It moved with purpose, swift and deliberate, but it wasn't running. It seemed almost casual, as if it had done this a thousand times before. I can't believe what I'm seeing, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. The creature continued its trek along the edge of the wood line, disappearing from our view for brief moments before re-emerging, moving effortlessly through the thick underbrush. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was something extraordinary, something beyond my comprehension. We watched as it finally made its way deeper into the woods, vanishing from sight about 800 yards down the right of way. What the hell just happened? Earl exclaimed, his disbelief palpable. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing. I've hunted these bottoms for over 60 years, and I've never seen anything like that. I thought I'd seen it all. We sat in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity, the weight of the encounter hanging heavy in the air. The cold seeped back into my thoughts, and I realized the chill was more than just the temperature, it was the realization that we had witnessed something beyond explanation. This place has always had its mysteries, Earl said finally, breaking the stillness. But that, that was something else. I drove in silence, my thoughts swirling. The certainty I had held for so long, that I understood this land and its creatures, felt shattered. I remembered all the stories I had dismissed over the years, tales of strange creatures lurking in the woods. How could I have been so blind? Days turned into weeks, and I found myself returning to that spot by the utility right of way. Each time, I felt a strange pull to the area, a desire to understand what I had seen. The river bottoms were a part of me, and now they held secrets I needed to uncover. One day, I reached out to a local wildlife investigator I'd heard about. 
He had been studying reports of strange creatures in these woods for years. I found his number in the local directory and, with a mixture of excitement and apprehension, called him. I want to know what's out there, I said, the urgency in my voice palpable. After a lengthy conversation, the investigator met me in person. He listened patiently as I recounted my sighting, his eyes glinting with understanding. I've had many reports from this area, he said. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. There's something out there, and you're not alone in your experience. His words felt like a release, and I knew I had to delve deeper. Over the following months, we explored the river bottoms together, tracking sightings and gathering evidence. Each outing filled me with renewed determination, as the landscape whispered its secrets. The more I ventured into the depths of the woods, the more I began to notice signs of the unknown. Strange footprints, broken branches, and the sounds of something moving just out of sight. I felt the thrill of discovery, my long-held beliefs challenged with every visit. I learned that for over a century, people had reported similar sightings. Massive, humanoid creatures that moved through the woods with grace and strength. Legends intertwined with reality, and I began to understand that my years of hunting had shielded me from the truth hiding in the shadows. One chilly morning, as the mist hung low over the river, I stood at the edge of the woods, the weight of my rifle resting comfortably in my hands. I was no longer just a hunter, I was a seeker, determined to unravel the mysteries of my homeland. As I peered into the depths of the forest, I felt a strange sense of kinship with the land. The trees whispered of forgotten tales, and the river flowed with the echoes of those who had come before me. I had become part of a narrative much larger than myself. Let's see what else you have to show me, I murmured to the wilderness, a smile creeping onto my face. The shadows danced playfully in the trees, and for the first time, I felt a sense of wonder in the unknown. Though my life had changed, my passion for the outdoors remained steadfast. I still checked on the cattle, but now, every trip to the river bottoms held the promise of discovery. I had come to embrace the secrets hidden in the landscape, knowing that what lay beyond my understanding was just waiting to be revealed. As I drove down that familiar highway, the clouds above began to break, letting the sun pierce through. I felt the warmth on my skin, a reminder that sometimes the unknown is where the greatest adventures begin. My journey was just starting, and I was ready to meet whatever awaited me in the wilds of the Ozarks. I saw something I am unable to explain, I documented it but the eyes of your moth man looked just like what I saw but I didn't see the rest of it though. I became aware of something in the bush where I was walking, as I passed the area of bush I stopped and found myself staring at what looked like two large oval red and orange eyes that seemed to glow but weren't illuminating the area around it. The glowing eyes appeared just off ground level. I walked on but felt a need to go back as I was very confused about what I had just seen and I had goosebumps all over but it had gone. I went to my car and brought it back and illuminated the bush with the headlights but there was nothing there. The next day I felt totally freaked out, in fact I did for about a week and still can't explain what I saw. This was in early 2011. How big would you say the eyes were as in width across both eyes? I'm in New Zealand. I was awoke at 4 am to find myself unable to move in my bed. There was a curved screen floating above my head. The screen appeared to have no mass as there was no edges of the screen. The screen was translucent and I could see through it. Small images would blink on the screen every half a second. Each time the image appeared it would be the same image displayed on the screen a hundred images at the same time. I didn't recognize any of the symbols as being known to me. I then peered through the screen and saw two dark figures. They were standing in opposite corners of my room at the foot of my bed. The figures were no more than four foot tall and were covered in a shroud of shifting darkness and shadow. I felt a sense of fear come over me. It was dire fear. 
I remember looking over at my dog who was sleeping on my bed with me and feeling upset that the dog was still sleeping and not barking at the intruders or try to help me. I then yelled at the two intruders and told them, hell no. I'm not allowing it and I told them they had to leave immediately. I couldn't make out any facial features but could see one of the intruders turn its head to the other one as if it was in shock of the fact that I had ordered them to leave. The blackness and shroud around them appeared to move rapidly or shimmer as much as black fog can shimmer and then they were gone. Immediately I had control of my body and could move again. I jumped up and turned the lights on and searched the room for the entities. I didn't find anything. I was visibly shaken by the experience and it took me a few minutes to calm down and stop my body from shaking. I looked at the clock when I jumped out of bed and it said 4.30 am. I remember being upset because I had to get up at 8 am to get the turkey ready to go in the oven for Thanksgiving. My daughter and I were coming home from her birthday party at my parents' house tonight, November 16, 2017. We live in northern Maine, all the roads are rural, animal collisions are as common as stop lights in the city. Having driven these roads for 25 years, I'm very attentive when it comes to driving at night. Tonight, a huge buck appeared in the middle of the road. There were no cars, we were on a straightaway, there is no reason I wouldn't have seen this animal wander out from the woods. It was like someone turned the deer light on. He just appeared out of nowhere. When I saw him, I slammed my brakes and veered to the right, he turned around and went left. I hit him on my driver's side headlight. I know I hit him, I heard the metal crunch, he went sprawling across the road. My daughter heard the bang and asked me what happened. I just stammered I think I hit a deer. I pulled over to the side of the road, put my four ways on and composed myself. I've never hit animal in my life. Around here, when you see an animal in the road and a car pulled over, you stop. Someone hits a rabbit and 50 people will stop to make sure the driver is okay. No one was stopping or even slowing down. This confused me greatly. I finally got out to see the damage to my car and to call the game wardens. There wasn't a ding on the car. Nothing, the headlights and fender was perfect. No hair or blood, no deer in the road, nothing was wrong. When the police and game warden showed up, I told them what happened. The police checked out my car, the wardens looked for the deer. This is an everyday occurrence, these guys wouldn't have missed an animal that was wounded by a car. Even if it had crawled into the field or bushes, this deer was a good-sized buck with a huge rack on his head. He had to be injured just by the sheer impact of my car going 55 miles an hour and colliding with his front legs. All I kept saying was, I know I hit a deer. We heard the bang. I heard the metal crunch and the lamp glass breaking. I saw the deer fly by my window into the road. I even got out my bright S spotlight and looked into the ditch, bushes, fields. Not even small animals had been crossing into the bushes. My daughter kept asking the police if the deer was okay, but they kept telling her there was no animals in the road. She looked at them as if they were nuts. I saw the deer go by my window. There was a loud bang, I heard glass breaking. She told one of the wardens. You need to make sure he's not hurt in the bushes. I know it wasn't my imagination, my daughter saw and heard the same thing I did. But. Not one car slowed down and the first one showed up less than minute after I stopped. That deer wouldn't have had time to pull itself across the road. I would have had some damage to my front end. It's an 05, the front bumper is Rubbermaid plastic. There would have been at least some scratches on the hood or front fender. Sorry for the long comment, but in all my years, I've never encountered a ghost deer car accident. I know that I'm lucky that is all that happened. I've seen moose and deer collisions that ended with severe casualties. People decapitated by hooves going through the windshield, cars torn apart by sheer force alone. My story goes back to 1984 in the fall. It was October here in New Jersey where I'm located. I'm not very far from the waterfront of the bay. 
This time of year, right now, is striped bass fishing season. Well, back in 1984, I was down at the dock and it was one of those harbor nights with the fog out, and it was about maybe 1 or 1.30 in the morning. I was waiting for the high tide to come in. I had two fishing rods out and I was cutting bait. I'm at the very end of the pier which is about, between 80 and 100 feet, I would say, long. And if you walk on a wooden pier, you can hear somebody coming from distance off. Well, I didn't hear a sound but I got my back to my two fishing rods and I heard somebody say, fella, you're getting a hit on one of those rods there. I turned around and I looked at. My first instinct was to look on my fishing rod and I noticed that, yeah, the tip was bouncing around and then I turned and here's a fella about, I would guess, in his mid-70s and he said, you fish here much? He says, because you're about to lose that fish if you don't go ahead and set the hook. I grabbed the fishing rod and I set the hook and I reeled it in. It turned out to be a bottom fish. A little skate and I said, thanks for the eye. I said, I wasn't looking, I said. He might have pulled the rod over. And he says, it happens at times. I unhooked the fish, dropped it over the side and turned around to grab my rag and the man was gone. Now, like I said, this pier was between 80 and 100 feet out to where I was at the end and there's no stairs or anything like that. You have to walk straight down this pier to go back and get back out onto the sidewalk into the street. There wasn't a splash except for the one of me throwing back the fish. I turned around and he was gone just as quick as he came. Nuri asks if he thinks he was an old fisherman that had passed on, I would imagine so because, from what I heard, there's been a lot of sightings down there of elderly men at night, who you can see down there. And when you go down to the pier, there's nobody there. I used to attend Kansas State University. I graduated from there and this was about 1978. About once a month, I would take I-70 West and go to Kansas City, Kansas and party with some friends and go out Saturday night. Then Sunday we'd all have a big lunch and then I'd drive back to Manhattan, Kansas for another week of school. One day there was snow on the ground. It was cold in November and I was about halfway to Manhattan and I was really sleepy. So I pulled my 71 Chevelle over that had a really bad leaky exhaust system and it was kind of stupid but I sat there on the side of the road, rolled the windows up, left the engine on with the heater to keep me warm and I fell asleep. I was gonna take a nap. So, next thing I know, I hear tapping on the window. I look over and there's a little man standing outside. I rolled the window down and he said, Hey, I stopped to check on you. Are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. Thank you. So he started to walk back to the back of the car and then I realized my car was full of carbon monoxide. My eyes are burning. So I shut it off real quick, reached over, rolled down the driver window, and got out. I could have died and I was going to thank that guy. Well, I looked. I could see about two miles in each direction on I-70. It was kind of flat and this was just before sunset and there was no cars anywhere. So I got back in my car and I drove about 80 miles an hour for about 5 or 10 minutes trying to find this guy, so I could flag him down and shake his hand and thank him for saving my life, but I never caught up with him. So about three weeks later, the next month, I was on my same trip. I went down for the weekend. I was coming back Sunday. It was earlier in the day and there was no snow on the ground. I happened to recognize the area where I'd stopped before because there was this kind of weird looking tree there. It was kind of crooked. So I thought I'll stretch my legs. So I pulled over, shut the car off, got out and I walked over toward the ditch side. There was a typical barbed wire fence like you'd see out in the country. I looked over the fence. There's this grassy area and there's a bunch of tombstones and so, right at the area where I stopped, where this little man saved my life, there was like a family-sized graveyard. I looked over the fence and I just said, thank you, and got back in my car and left. Well a really long time ago I was working security. 
I was sent to fill in for somebody one night at this hospital which was no longer a hospital. It was really only kept for filming and security was hired basically to keep away squatters and vagrants and vandals and that, you know, trust me, I'm an Ella girl you do not have to turn your back very long to get either of them. In the big cities, it's just par for the course. So I showed up, and the guy that I was relieving showed me the ropes, told me what I had to do and told me that there would be a guy as backup. This guy was welded to the seat in the lobby with a mini TV in his lap and earphones on his face so he's pretty much deaf and blind to the world. He could have been a scarecrow in a uniform. So I'll just refer to him as scarecrow from this point on. So as I leave the lobby and starting to patrol the building. Even though nothing was happening there was a very eerie dead quiet about the place. And the appearance, it looked like something out of the twilight zone. I mean, it looked like maybe a minute ago it was a super busy hospital and then everyone just disappeared because there was just books and file folders scattered about, the phones were off the hook, medical instruments scattered about. It reminded me more of like the Christian notion of the rapture. Like, snap, everyone's gone. That's exactly how it looked and as I'm going through the walkways, some of the hallways had windows and out of the corner of my eye, I would see, like, people, you know, there is one old man in the hospital gown and it looked like he had a monitor on wheels or an four on wheels, I'm not sure which, and it looked like he was floating, I guess. It's because as he was passing through the hall, you didn't see a gate or any steps. I could only see from the torso up. The rest was blocked by the hallway. Aside from Scarecrow, I was literally had the whole entire building to myself and that happened a couple more times where I would see people peripherally but whenever I turned to look at them, they always disappeared. There were the cold spots that would form. At first, it would be like a very small area and then it would just spread out. I would say that this was in like the late 90s when this happened. Bell Witch, I think is Tennessee. Okay I am fairly sure that I was about 3 or 4 or roundabout, you know, I was away at camp. This is back in 1959, so it goes back a ways. Anyway, we found. Well, one guy was from the general area of that town, wherever that was, Adams. I don't know the background of the Bell Witch. I guess that's the reason for the call. I just remember the Andrew Jackson story about the horses being scared by the entity or something like that. But that's all ancient news to me because I don't hardly remember. Anyway, we see a rabbit. That rabbit was the biggest thing I have ever seen in my life. I mean this thing was like the size of a cow, you know, it was like all white and it had one black foot on the rear, one of the back legs. One of the back legs was black and I was told that was the entity that the bell witch switches into. I don't know why she would have done that but. And I didn't want to. I said, man, we ain't going over there because just to look at his thing was. I mean it looked at us. It seen us. I mean we were quite a ways away from it but I was sure it could see us and I didn't want any part of being near that thing. Just, it just did not have a very pleasant look to it. Okay, I've worked for a local police department for a lot of years. It's been a few years ago now. I can't even remember how far back. It's gotta been five or six years ago or better. One night we were on patrol, my partner and I. He's a good friend. His name's Mike. And it was very late, you know, 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning and we were at the little traffic light in the middle of town, you know, and we were just sitting there. This particular night, it was really quiet. There was like, you know, there was nothing. And here comes this car off the main highway. And we're kind of working our main street and there's this highway that runs through and it's pulling off the highway, you know, heading into the village. We're looking at this car and we both kind of recognize it. And it's slowing down and like, really, you know, ridiculously slow and we're thinking they're going to try to ask us directions or something. We're like, oh, great, here it goes. You never know what you are going to get. You never know if they are going to report something. 
So we're kind of gearing up to see what they're gonna do and as we're watching, the car passes right in front of our headlights. You know, my story doesn't start on a dark and stormy night and that's a problem, you know, because maybe we'd have been able to pass this off as something else. But we're looking right at this, you know, at the driver's face. We both know who it is, she was a troubled teen. She was in her late teens, early twenties, you know, kind of a frequent flyer. We busted her on shoplifting. She was basically a good kid, but we knew who she was. She lived across the street from the police department for quite a while. We all knew who this was and we knew the car. And now it's at a crawl and I mean, you know, we're thinking she's gonna stop for sure and say something and she's just staring at us, unblinking, and my partner exclaims, hey, that's a. He stops and I just started to get her name out of my mouth and that's about where I freeze because, all of a sudden, you know, up until this point, the main problem is. We both realize. She had been killed two months before. Driving that car. You see people like that and it's so solid and so normal you don't think about it, you're not thinking about it. And, yeah, she had crossed the center line, somewhere, and then there was a head on. She was killed instantly. Now, at this point, the car goes past us and I turn around. I'm looking through the back seat, through the cage. We're trained observers. There could be two of the same car but we're gonna know your car by the dent in the front quarter panel. This is something, you're out there 12 hours a day. You're so used to, you know, and there was no mistake. So now we're both kinda upset. I look back and this car is gone. There's no way this girl disappeared. It's a pretty clear shot. You can see the road behind you. There's no tail lights. No nothing. We pull out into the highway which is empty, do a big screaming U-turn to go after that thing, because now we want to find that car real bad. There's no way she was gonna out drive us or hide. There wasn't a driveway she was gonna park in and get away. We went down a few streets. We're looking all over the place. There's only one place that car could have gone and that's back to the other side. To preface this whole story is, in the days leading up to this happening, it had been like a little while before, but my partner's father had passed away and we had had a lot of discussions out there in the squad car about, you know, hoping that this life isn't the end of the road. So we're both kind of freaked out. He's like, why did we see her? And I was like, well, Mike, that's that's a direct face-to-face -face answer to the question. George Nuri asks if that was the place she was killed, it wasn't. She had been killed a little ways away. It was like she was just, you know, driving into the town and it's like, I mean that's why I, it was like very deliberate. She found us in the squad car. And that car that we saw her in, you know, the phantom car, that was a phantom of the exact same car, because we had been there. It was the car that she was driving when she got killed. We were parked in the parking lot of the community center in Piotrowski Park, in Chicago, the park lies within Little Village, at about 10.30 p.m. We had just both gotten off work at 10 p.m. and decided to meet up at the park and spend some time together before going home. We were in my boyfriend's car talking and listening to music when it felt like something hit his car from behind. There was no one else in the parking lot except his car and mine but it felt like a car had hit him. My boyfriend stopped what he was doing and was going to step out to see what hit his car when something large dropped onto the hood of his car. We looked, and both screamed at the same time as we saw a pair of bright orange eyes peering back at us through the windshield. The thing that landed was solid black and was about the size of a man and had what looked like wings that were spread out wide. It looked right at us and then appeared to swipe the windshield with his hand, the fingers were long, much longer than a normal person and ended in what looked like claws. It looked like it was trying to get into the car and at us, we were both screaming as it swiped the windshield three to four times. My boyfriend then grabbed a flashlight that he had in the car and shined it through the windshield at this thing. It then shrieked out loud, it sounded like what the screams of multiple people in a small room would sound like. Then it flexed its wings and took off straight up and was gone from our sight. 
We heard it shriek out at least twice about one minute apart as it probably circled the area after which we heard silence. We were both scared beyond belief and I was hysterical and crying, afraid to get out as I thought it might swoop down and attack me if I did. We spent 15 minutes in my boyfriend's car and eventually calmed down enough to attempt to get out of the car and sprint to my car. My boyfriend got out and escorted me to my car. Once I was inside and the doors locked, he sprinted back to his car and also got ready to leave. I have never been so scared in my entire life and when I got home, I had to go into the bathroom and compose myself before facing my family. We talked about the incident at work on Monday and that is when I decided to come home and look up information if anyone else had seen this thing. I was shocked to see so many sightings had occurred and decided to report mine. I am willing to talk to someone about this incident, but my boyfriend is refusing to as this would jeopardize both our jobs and our families. I am willing to talk and show you the place where it happened, but only if my name or address is not used and we can be discreet about this. It's funny how time works. I saw something strange 20 years ago which I didn't even know was strange until recently. I was listening to a podcast which rekindled a long forgotten memory. The particular episode was about shadow people, mysterious dark figures which sometimes show up in and around people's homes. I vaguely remember reading something about them a couple of years ago, but they themselves didn't spark any memories for me. However, it was one type of shadow person in particular, hat man, which caused me to do a double take while listening. Rewinding to the spring of 1997, I was a freshman at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. My dorm room was located on the third floor of the rather drab looking. It was early, with the faint blue light of morning just beginning to seep through the crack between the window and the curtain. It might have been the weekend because I recall my roommate had gone home and was not there that morning. I opened my eyes, and the first thing I noticed was a figure sitting next to my bed no more than three or four feet away. The beds in the dorms were set lower to the ground than a typical bed would have been, so I had a clear line of sight, and it's a sight I'll now never forget. The figure was sitting on the floor with his back up against the bed. His feet were flat on the floor with his knees pointing straight up. His arms were resting on his knees casually and he appeared to be looking slightly down. I couldn't make out the details of any clothing, all I saw was a deep black body. But the feature that was most dominant, and why I'm referring to the figure as a he, was the wide-brimmed hat he was wearing. I could not make out a face, mostly because the brim of the hat was obscuring it from the side. I had to blink hard a couple of times to ensure that my eyes were clear, but when I did he was still there. My next cogent thought was that a drunk person had stumbled into the wrong room and passed out, after all, this was college. The problem with that, however, was I always locked my door at night. Hello? I said in an aggressive tone, trying to convey that I was clearly unhappy with a stranger intruding in my room. After a second or two, but what felt like a minute or two, the figure slowly faded away, the spot where he was sitting visibly lightening as he did. At the time, it was weird because before that I had never had a groggy dreamlike vision which I knew some people had when they woke up in the morning or in the middle of the night. 20 years later, and I still have not had any drowsy visions. That morning was the only time I have ever experienced anything like that. Even though it was a one-time occurrence, it was obvious to me that, for whatever reason, my brain had indeed conjured up an early morning foggy illusion and I didn't think about it nearly at all for the next two decades. But just recently, more or less exactly 20 years after that morning, I learned about the ghostly entity known as Hatman. Upon hearing the first description while listening to that podcast, I immediately thought of the shadow-like figure I had seen that morning in my dorm room at Rutgers. The parallels with dozens of accounts were there. The figure I had seen had that large brimmed hat, was darker than the darkest black, and was spotted near my bed. What's the probability that my subconscious decided to create such an image 20 years before I even knew an almost identical being existed in the paranormal world? That memory, which has basically lain dormant for the past 20 years, has now taken on a whole new level of eeriness for me.
When I was a teenager, I always felt hot at night and the AC was weak in my room. It was normal for me to sleep in the living room where cool air would circulate much better. We also had two kittens that were very hyper at night, totally normal to hear some movement. One night I could hear the computer chair behind the couch running back and forth over tile lines. Finally annoyed over the sound, I decided to go adjust the seat somehow so that it won't move. I opened my eyes only to see the kittens actually sleeping across from me. And finally when my brain computes it can't be the cats, the chair stops like it was grabbed. I just laid their eyes wide for what felt like an hour not daring to look. I was home alone, cleaning a gun of mine when I heard the front door open and close. My other gun which was beside me I grabbed and walked to the main room of my house where the door was located nothing. I called out make yourself known I have a weapon. Nothing. Went through three rooms and then went back to the living room. My gun I was cleaning was put back together. I went over to it and was very concerned. I heard in a deep drawl, that wasn't very smart, now was at the door behind me slammed shut. With a deep demonic cackle. I unloaded my mag into the door and kicked it down. Blood drops all the way to my front door. My camera to my house didn't catch anyone leaving or entering. It was facing the door too. The first time my parents left me alone to go out, I was about 11 to 12. We lived in a duplex, and the neighbor was with my parents, usually she was home. Watching Beetlejuice and I hear a knock on the front living room window, which scares me into running upstairs. About 10 PM, I can hear someone outside as I call my parents' friend's house hysterically crying that someone's breaking in. My mom thinks I am being a drama queen, when we hear a boom, someone just hit the back sliding glass door. Mom's on her way. No one was there but we did call police. Of course, they all thought I was just a scared kid. But my mom was not so sure. She worked for probation and parole and was concerned someone had followed her home. To this day, we have no idea if that is true, or not. But that night a woman was kidnapped and murdered two streets over. She was jogging, my mother had to write up what was called his chronos which is his autobiography, basically. He admitted that he used to drive up and down XYZBLVD looking at the little girls. We lived on XYZBLD. Was it him? We will never know, but I know I did not imagine that. Alone with my wife in a modern cabin, in the middle of the woods, on a gorgeous and lazy summer afternoon. The peace was shattered by an unseen commotion and crash that shook the building for a few seconds. The best way I can describe it is as if the house was a bell that had been rung with us inside. The peaceful sounds of a summertime forest returned as if nothing had happened. My brain immediately thought a tree fell on the house. Went out to investigate and found no signs of anything striking the house. No damage to the siding, roof, windows, etc in any capacity. Surveyed the nearby tree line and could not spot any felled trees that hadn't been there before. So we checked inside and again found everything intact and as it should be. I spent hours looking for anything to explain WTF just happened. The nearest neighbor was miles away and earthquakes are extremely rare where we were, and I looked up to confirm there was no seismic activity that day because this bothers me so much. To this day I have no idea what force was exerted on that building to make it shake and reverberate the way we experienced it nor have I been able to identify the crashing sound we heard before the house trembled. I tore that property apart and found no explanation. What bothers me most is how isolated the experience was to my wife and I. Our dogs made no reaction and nothing appeared to spook the wildlife. Like whatever happened targeted us specifically. I was sleeping at my boyfriend's, now fiancé. Sometime in the night, I had an indescribable amount of dread fill me. It was so intense that I felt my body was filled with intense fear, like the deepest pit of existential dread. At one point, I look over to the corner of the room near the sliding glass door and I see an incredibly tall man with a top hat. Not as much black, but a void. His presence was so oppressive and malignant that it felt like the room was being absorbed into him. I heard faintly in the background some sharp, repetitive noise. I kept staring at him feeling completely absorbed in my fear and the feeling of sinking away. My boyfriend shook me, totally wigged out. 
I was looking in the corner of the room and our dog was the noise in the background that I heard, barking into the corner where the man stood. We don't talk about it often. I was in college the dorm I lived in was an all-male dorm but was originally a female-only dorm. I came home from work late around midnight and when I returned my roommate was already asleep and snoring. My roommate had a very deep voice when he spoke. I was checking my email before bed with my back to our bunk beds and I heard a distinctly female voice whisper in my ear what are you doing in my room? I immediately turned around and looked at my roommate who was still asleep snoring. I composed myself and assumed it was my roommate despite having a higher pitch than his voice. I shut down my computer hopped onto the top bunk and tried to fall asleep with my back facing the center of the room. A few minutes later I heard the same voice whisper louder what are you doing in my room? From what sounded like behind me. At this point I jumped out of bed looked at my roommate who was still asleep. I ended up leaving my room and falling asleep in the well lit common room. It was a very stressful last couple of months in that room. My husband, my dog and I live in a top floor apartment in a secure access building. Since I'm home alone quite a bit, this was perfect, seemed pretty creep proof. Fast forward to a couple weekends ago, the husband and I were at home watching the game on TV, when we got a knock at the door. It wasn't really late at night, but still late enough that we weren't expecting anyone to come knocking. My husband went to the door to ask who's there, didn't hear anything, and slowly opened the door, which made my dog bark madly and run out into the hall to see who was there. It was a girl we'd never seen before she seemed nervous, which we chalked up to the dog scaring her. She never said anything at first, and when my husband and I asked if she needed help, she just said no before heading back downstairs. Weird, but okay we just figured she went to the wrong unit and figured out where she was supposed to go. About a week later, she was back. My husband was working late, and I was home alone with my dog in our locked apartment. He got home after midnight and told me she was sitting out there in our top floor stairwell landing. That spooked me I had no clue that she was lurking so close to my place, and I have no clue how long she might have been out there. Again, we went out and asked if she needed help, to which she said no and that she had nowhere else to go. I had that really uneasy feeling again, and this time I convinced my husband that we needed to call the cops for one thing, we were concerned for her well-being, and on top of that I was feeling uneasy about having trespassers camping out in my hallway or stairwells. The cops came and escorted her out, and that was the last we saw of her. We never mentioned anything to anyone in our building until a couple nights ago when we were out walking our dog and stopped to talk to neighbors of ours who live a few doors down. Apparently this girl was creepier than we thought, and within the past couple of weeks a bunch of people in our building have reported her to the police. She's been getting into the building by climbing open lower level windows, climbing onto the lower level balconies, and hiding in the dark corners of our building's lobby, currently unlit, because the landlord hasn't changed the bulbs, and sneaking in behind people leaving and entering the building. Somehow, she even managed to break into the third floor hallway and wrote a creepy note and doodle on the wall using nail polish. That prompted one of our neighbors to call the cops, who took her in for evaluations. Everyone's really creeped out right now clearly this girl isn't stable, and is able to breach the secure access. Even the cops have said she is unpredictable. Can't wait to move out of here so I can be clear of the creepy hallway lurker. So just to clarify I was 15 home alone, and lived on a Native American reservation at the time. Shit would happen all the time, hearing things, walking at night you would see shadows etc. The kids would call them skin walkers. Besides the point. This was during the day my mom was at work, labor and delivery, and me well I dropped out of school due to a medical situation. So I had this huge window in my room I am talking wide took about about a whole section of one wall just enough space to fit a vanity and my TV on both sides. I was chilling, smoking weed, walking around my room, showered at one point so I changed. All while a man was sitting on a wooden post directly across from my backyard watching me. I didn't have curtains, when we first moved and they had ugly blinds hanging up, I tore them down and put up really cool like blankets, lol. And during the day I would tie them up so light would come in, Arizona is a beautiful state so to see dessert every morning along with the sunrise is amazing. Hours pass and my mom comes home and we go to Taco Bell I vividly remember being on Twitter in my room eating my cheese dias when all of a sudden the light in the hallway went off. So I was like okay it's my mom, but then my door opened slightly, 
and my mind was racing at that point it's about 9.30 pm at night my lights off and my room only light is my phone. I start calling my cat's names, we had three, and that's when I see him. A tall man red baseball hat and jeans. I was going through a hard time so I had a depression pit and started screaming and throwing hangers and empty soda cans screaming for my mom, who was home and her room was next to mine. She comes out flips my light on and there is no one there. I'm telling her call the police there was a man in my room. So my mommy gets her switch blade from her room and walks me through every room upstairs until we look down into the living room from our balcony and see the blanket from our guest room on the floor. Then my mom looks at me and says stay back, being that it was my mom I held her hand and we end up downstairs in the office room where the windows wide open. To cut to the end, the man was arrested breaking into another home, and when asked about me, he was ready to take me kidnap etc and was watching me. The neighbors called 911 because they saw him trying to get into our gated backyard. My mom saved my life a few hours before I don't know what would have happened. Someone, or something, banged on my door at 3 am, then my cell phone suddenly stopped working. This was back when I was in college in 2013-ish. I was living in Seattle at the time with three other roommates who were all out of the house when this happened. I had been home alone for most of the night and decided for some genius reason to watch a scary movie around midnight, it was the one where there are no laws for 24 hours and you can do whatever you want. The name is on the tip of my tongue, but honestly it's not that important. So while I was watching it, my roommate's cat kept looking at this specific corner of my living room and meowing, which he rarely did unless he wanted to go outside. Throughout the night he would spastically run around the house like he was being chased, then would give off these little yelps like something was pulling his tail. He'd never done that before, so I was definitely spooked. I know animals are pretty sensitive to paranormal shit, so my mind immediately went there. After about an hour of watching this movie and the cat acting really weird, I decided to watch something else. Eventually the cat calmed down and I kinda just forgot about it. Around 2.30 or 3 am, I decided to go back to my room and settle down, so I turned off all the lights in the house and went to my room. I should quickly explain that my room was on the same floor as all the common spaces. I lived in a duplex type of house, so we had people living below us. The house was the kind where the front of the house was street level, but it was on a hill. So the front of the floor I was on was street level but the back part of the floor where my bedroom was was a story high. Hope that made sense. Anyway, I'm home alone, in my room at around 3 am chatting on the phone with my boyfriend at the time. We hang up and I'm about to turn my lights off and go to bed when all of a sudden I hear this three extremely loud knocks on my front door. I can't really even call it a knock because it was very loud and very aggressive, like a grown man was banging on my door. I poke my head out my bedroom door and contemplate whether I should go investigate, which I decide to absolutely not do. One reason for this was because my door had a huge window in the middle of it that had these patterns in the glass where some of the sections were frosted, but some others weren't. So if someone wanted to peek through and take a look at our living room, they could definitely see it. Also, our porch light wasn't working so. LOL no. So I kinda just lay there to wait and see if they'd knock again. After about 30 seconds, I heard it again, three very loud bangs. I figured maybe it was one of my roommates who forgot their key, so I texted the group chat, no response and my text turned green, we all had iPhones, so it would've normally been blue. A little freaked, I tried calling my dad, but my phone wouldn't connect and dropped the call. I tried again, and again my phone dropped the call almost immediately. I tried calling my boyfriend, same thing. Which was weird because it said I had full bars, I always did in my room and I never had a call drop multiple times in a row before. So obviously I started getting a little worried. Tried calling one of my roommates and same thing happened. I figured okay, maybe it's one of those instances where I could only call the emergency line, so I called 911 really just to test it. Call dropped after half a second. I tried texting and none of my texts would go through, they all just turned green. This was all within like 3 minutes of that banging I heard on the door. I was really scared at this point knowing that if anything happened I couldn't even call for help. I didn't know what else to do so I just laid down and pulled the covers over my head to try and sleep. Next morning my phone worked perfectly. Roommates trickled in and I asked each of them if they came home and knocked on the door at 3 am, they said no. I asked the downstairs tenants if they knocked or if someone knocked on their door, they said no. I also asked our neighbor next to us and across from us when I saw them outside at different points during the next few days and they said they didn't have anyone knock at 3 am. I don't know WTF happened or who was at the door or why my phone suddenly stopped working. 
I've been listening to this podcast about BEKs, Black Eyed Kids, and I wonder if that was possibly what happened since the banging was so aggressive and technology was affected. It really was the phone thing that got me, and with the cat acting really strange earlier. It just was all too weird and very scary. Still freaks me out to this day. Guess I'll never know. Years back, I made a late night stop at a local Walmart on my way home from a friend's house. It was in a quiet area, not a lot of people out and about at nearly 1 am. I've lived around there for years and never run into any truly criminal elements there, so I felt safe going to the store alone as a woman in my early 20s. I made eye contact with a teenage girl the second I walked in the door. She was parked on a bench by the restrooms, hugging a backpack and small purse, checking her phone with a rather desperate expression on her face. When she looked at me I could tell that she on the verge of panicking. After a brief second of staring at me, she went back to checking her phone and making phone calls. At the other end of the bench was a white-haired man in jeans and a t-shirt. If I had to guess, he was probably in his late 50s or early 60s. Altogether nothing appeared off about him. But what struck me was the fact that he never looked up as I passed. Instead, his eyes were absolutely glued to the teenage girl next to him. Not in a passive way, but like he was sizing her up for something. She was perched on the edge of the bench, angling herself away from his gaze and leaning away from him, her body language screamed that she wanted nothing to do with him. Something about him set off warning bells in my head as I went about grabbing the items I had stopped for. I'm normally the type of person that mills about stores aimlessly, making a point to wander each all just to see what's for sale. That night, however, I felt a pressing need to get in and out of the store as quick as possible, and something in the back of my head told me to keep an eye on the man on the front bench. I moved my knife from my purse to the front pocket of my jeans where it would be easily accessible, that's how uneasy I felt being in the same building as this man. As I purchased my items, I watched the pair on the front bench. The man had moved halfway across the space between them, and was trying to chat with the young woman. She was shaking her head and offering one-word answers, looking like a rabbit about to bolt. As I walked past them again to leave with my purchases, she stopped me and asked if I was headed anywhere close to my old hometown. Apparently she'd been on her way home from a trip with friends and they had made a stop to grab drinks and use the restroom. She'd gotten separated from the group and they left her at the store. The store was about a 30 minute drive from my old hometown, and I knew that to get home she'd have to walk several hours along unlit stretches of rural highway. The man sitting next to her continued to leer at her but refused to look my way. While I would normally have told the girl that I was headed the opposite direction, something in the back of my head told me not to leave her alone with the man. I agreed to take her home, and she thanked me profusely and offered gas money and a cigarette. I refused both and took her home, the logical part of my brain reasoning that the girl weighed maybe 100 pounds and was a full head shorter than I was, so if it came down to it I could fight her off, I wasn't stupid either, I texted a few friends to let them know what I was doing and they were not happy with me. The girl mentioned her address, and I knew exactly where she was talking about, it was an old, quiet neighborhood where I used to play little league baseball down the street and swim in the pool a few blocks away. During the drive, she told me that she just moved to the area with her mom and younger sisters from a larger city several hours south. She'd taken off with a few of her old friends for the weekend and her mom hadn't expected her back until the following day, so she'd silenced her phone for the night and hadn't picked up when the girl tried to call. Edit, I vaguely remember something about her mom having to work early in the morning, and none of the girl's sisters were old enough to have their own phones. We arrived at our destination, and the girl gave me a handshake and a thank me repeatedly, asking if there was anything she could do to repay me. I told her, yeah, do me a favor? Get better friends. Looking back, I have no idea what about the man creeped me out so much, but something about him and the way he was staring at that girl got my hackles up. I had thought in passing that he might have been waiting for someone else in the store, perhaps someone using the nearby restroom, but upon checking out it struck me that I hadn't seen any other customers there, so he really had no reason to be waiting on that bench. I was still living with my parents at the time, so when I got home I woke my mom up and told her what happened. She hesitated, and I could see that she didn't like the idea of me giving a stranger a ride home, but in the end she agreed that something had prompted me to take action, and that I might have saved that young girl from being harassed. Or worse. My family and I used to live in a rough neighborhood when I was a kid, seven yo. One night, it was just my mom, me, and my two siblings at home and my dad was gone on a business trip. That night around midnight, someone started knocking on our door. 
My mom woke up and went to the front door and asked who it was. No one answered. She thought that maybe it was some kids playing ding dong ditch, so she went back to bed. About 30 minutes later, again, someone starts knocking. She gets up and peers through the side window to see if she can spot anyone out there, but nobody is there. She starts to worry so she goes back to the room and grabs my dad's shotgun and sits in the living room in the dark waiting. Again, there's knocking. My mom begins shouting at whoever it is that she is going to call the cops and that if anyone tries to come in, that she would shoot them. At about 2 am, the police finally show up and do a quick search outside of our house while we waited inside. After their search, they tell my mom that they had found a piece of barbed wire about 4 feet long next to the front door and asked if it belonged to my mom. She said that it wasn't hers and asked why. The cop told her it belonged to whoever was knocking on the door. That they were planning on strangling my mom with the barbed wire when she opened the door to see who was knocking. They said that she was very smart to not open the door to see who was there, otherwise it could have cost her life. The cops said that they'd patrol the neighborhood until morning and do a thorough investigation once there was daylight. That morning as they were searching around the house, the found footprints leading around to the back of the house leading up to my bedroom window. They had also found nicks in the window seal where the person was trying to pry open the window to break in but failed. My mom always suspected it was this one neighbor because he would always stare at my mom through his curtains and wasn't very friendly. He also knew when my dad wasn't home since he knows what vehicle he drives. After that, we moved out of that house. First and foremost, while I am not a Christian myself, I do hold a healthy level of spirituality, and I am quite honestly okay with any faith practice out there, provided that it is also healthy, and does not overstep its boundaries. People are people and have the right to do as they please. But attacking someone using your faith as a weapon, that is something that I do not do. So I live in a rental house with two friends in a pretty decent neighborhood. We're in very close proximity to the neighbors, which is a fair portion of the reason that this is a problem. We've met them before in passing many times, but never had an actual conversation with. So I picked up yoga when I was in college as a means of relaxing and getting my mind right. It's something that I do daily, once in the morning, and sometimes in the evening. One of my friends also practices yoga and we usually do it together on our outside patio area. So the neighbors I'm referring to are a family of four, husband, wife, college-age daughter, and teenage son. I won't mention any names out of respect for privacy, and the obvious that nobody will actually care about their names. We were practicing yoga one morning, around 7 am, and the wife comes out and walks over to our fence. She seemed kind of cheerful, but she turned smug really fast. She said. Do you have to be doing that really? We tried briefly to converse with her from afar, but when we couldn't get the reasoning, we went over to her. She said that what we were doing wasn't right and that she didn't want her children exposed to that. We asked her what we were doing that was so wrong, and she pointed out that yoga was a form of meditation that isn't Christian and that they raised their family to believe in God. This woman also pointed out to what we were wearing, which was yoga pants and tank tops. She went as far as to point at my chest and say that during our yoga sessions, a lot of the moves and poses we did put those on display and it was something that she didn't want her children seeing. So the Lord that she pays worship to hath bestowed upon me the D cup, so no matter what I wear, they are going to be at least somewhat displayed. Lady I can't help that. Both myself, as well as my chiropractor, wish that this wasn't as big of an issue as it is, but it is, so we'll have to live with it. I just smiled and said that I'd be happy to cover up a little bit more during our morning yoga sessions. This wasn't enough, because she said that under no circumstances was it something that we should have been doing in the first place. Eventually she went back inside and we went about our day. It was two days later before we heard from them again. We were doing yoga outside, as we have been doing since we moved in, and we get another visit. I even went as far as putting a hoodie on, just to show a level of reasonability. This time she came with her daughter and we got yet another ear full about doing yoga. It was like she was on a mission to save our souls, rambling about manifesting energy, paying tribute to a Hindu god, and tampering with the metaphysical world. My friend had enough and told them to please stop harassing us, because we do yoga for about half an hour in the morning and in the evening, and that's it. We go on with our lives. She then pointed out that when they pray, they're not doing anything different than what we were doing. The two of them became very offended and then pouted off inside their house. The final straw came when the husband or patriarch of the family knocked on our door and handed us a pamphlet, that I swear, literally highlighted the dangers of yoga and the human soul. It looked like something you could find at the front of a church. It labeled a number of things wrong with it, 
and also listed a few things you could do to get right with God. For F's sake, it's yoga. I fail to see how this is offensive. We're not trying to hurt or offend anybody. Our other roommate, who is the only guy in the house, went later that day and returned the pamphlet to them and said that if he heard from any of them again that we would be pressing harassment charges on them. Thankfully we haven't heard from them since. We still practice yoga outside. It's our property. We have that right. As much as I'd love for there to just be peace, at some point you just have to put your foot down and acknowledge that it's ridiculous. If any spiritual person found anything I said to be offensive, I do wholeheartedly apologize. I'm not condemning all Christians, just the toxic ones. My neighbor was an old 60-year-old man who had been married for like 40 years. He adopted a puppy and I loved going over and playing with her. Him only ate by the way and my mom would let me go over there alone. He would always be like you've been naughty and need a spanking then would try to spank me. Me, being eight, thought it was weird. But whatever he had a cool puppy. I told my mom one day and she didn't believe me. Until one day she is bent over inside her car putting my little brothers in their car seats. Creep neighbor comes up and proceeds to spank her. Mom flips, tells dad, dad tells him to stop spanking his family. Then my cousin, same age, moved in with us and would follow us around our yard. We thought it was like a game of tag so we would run and laugh, while he creepily walks slowly towards us. One day he catches me and tries to shove his finger in my vagina. I scream, my little bro kicks him in the dick, and we run inside. Turns out the dude was a child molester. Surprise right? The sad thing is the guy who lived on the other side of us was a registered sex offender and had a talking parrot, so we would always go over there. He never did anything weird, but I realize I spent a large portion of my childhood hanging with weirdos. Very easily could have ended differently for me. Thanks mom and dad. Current upstairs neighbor. He disappears for weeks at a time. Then we will suddenly hear what sounds like a mosh pit happening at 11 p.m. on a weeknight announcing he's home. There's been a lot of things that have happened but the top two that pretty much sum up everything you need to know about just how creepy the guy is. One day I was bringing up groceries and he offered to help, I said, thank you and assumed he would just take the bags to the second floor landing, place them outside the door and then continue up to his apartment like our other neighbor who has done this exact thing before, no. He follows me back out to my car and then stands about 4 inches behind me as I lean into the trunk of my car to get the last two bags. He takes all of the bags, and then walks upstairs. As I finish saying the oh thank you, you really didn't have to do that lines and unlock my door, he goes oh it's no problem, I know your old man leaves for work early and you're home alone. I barely open the door enough to walk into my apartment, before I can turn around he has walked in. He opened up my fridge and puts the milk in. He starts looking around our apartment and into our bedroom. Now, just for context of why I didn't flip out and start screaming. It was 8 in the morning, and the two other people who live in our building were gone, so literally no one would have heard me. He is about 6 foot 2 and I am 5 foot 5 if I have on thick shoes. I go okay thanks for the help, I'll see you around. He continues to dig through the fridge and looking towards my bed. Then he turns and starts stepping towards me, then he realizes that I have a large butcher knife 4 inches away from my hand. He leaves. I call my husband who is at work an hour away crying and tell him what just happened. That night he goes to confront the guy, and he won't answer the door. So my husband goes up the next day, and the guy breaks down crying and tells my husband he doesn't remember anything and he is sorry, he was just trying to be neighborly. My husband just tells him my wife is a tough girl, she can carry the groceries up herself. 2. We woke up one night hearing someone yelling and screaming outside. When we look out our living room window we see upstairs creeper with blood streaming down his face, so drunk maybe high. He could barely stand screaming at police and not going to the damn hospital. Apparently he had gotten into a fight at the pool hall down the street with four or five other guys and gotten his ass kicked. Eventually the cops got a hold of him and took him to the hospital in cuffs. The next morning I went to go get groceries alone, my husband didn't have to work that day. When I came home, he was standing outside smoking a cigarette, you could tell he was still pretty intoxicated from whatever he was on the night before. This time he walked straight up to the car and acted like he was waiting for me to get out, but he stood by the trunk. This was also the first time I had seen him since the initial incident that he could have thought my husband wasn't home. I called my husband, and when he saw that I was on the phone, and heard my husband coming down the stairs of the building, he took off running around the corner. My husband took me to the store that day and got me a gun. 
Now anytime he sees me alone he just stares, but if my husband is around he acts like he doesn't even see us. I recently bought a very rundown fixer upper in a city in a more rural area an hour from where I live. Next door lives a couple, maybe in their late 40s, with their two young kids aged maybe one and three years old. For the first few weeks, I assumed he was divorced as I never saw his wife, even now I've only seen her twice in three months. At the beginning, when I first started fixing up the house, he was your typical friendly neighbor character, offering to lend me tools and giving slightly overbearing but good, he works in a DIY outlet, advice. I thought nothing of it, until it seemed I saw more and more of him with each visit, every time I was there he would kind of saunter over for no reason. We do share a driveway, so this is not overly strange, but it often seemed like whenever I was outside he would suddenly pop out of his house and find a reason to chat. Now, I'm not a flirt, and I don't look like Marilyn Monroe, plus he's met my husband, but I do think he thinks I'm much younger than him, I'm not, hence the slightly overbearing demeanor. However, I do like my quiet time and privacy, and one reason I like do it yourself is because I do it alone and it gives me time to think. Today things got weird. I'd been seeing him virtually every time I came to the house, so I was already sort of dreading coming out to try and finish the renovation ASAP. For the first time, I actually parked my car around the corner, not in our shared driveway, with the excuse that I was leaving the space free for the gas company who were coming that day. The car was out of sight, I'd let the gas man in quietly through the front door, he not in direct view of his windows, and afterwards I was just doing quiet work like painting, again, so he wouldn't hear me and find some excuse to come over. I was already hiding from him in my own house. Then I hear knocking on the back door. I peek out a side window and see him there with his daughter. I'm a little surprised that he even knew I was there, but for once decided not to open like I usually would. I just didn't want to be friendly to him as much anymore. He goes away. Maybe 15 minutes later, I'm happily painting away when I hear another knocking on the back door. I ignore it again. Then, he comes round to the front door, rings the doorbell once, then immediately begins to pound on the quite fragile door. It was the kind of bashing that said I know you are in there and I will not be ignored. Really aggressive and not a little alarming. So of course I have no choice to answer the door, since it really did sound like he was going to break it. He's there, without his daughter, and invites me over to lunch. This is a first. And though I know it might be rude to say no, I made the excuse that I was veggie, true, and that he'd probably made a meat dish. He had. He was frowning as he said all this, and it really set alarm bells off in my head. He has never invited me to lunch before, and even though he has a young daughter present, I just felt it's a trap in my head. Then he said, still frowning, I'll see you later. Not in a casual see ya if I see ya tone, but hey I plan to see you no matter what way. He actually nodded to himself as he said this. Sorry for the length. So folks, is this guy still just a well-meaning but overbearing ass? Or am I right to feel creeped out? He's always had this intense undertone, all the while as he tries to show what a nice guy he is. I just don't like him. Even worse, the house needs another week of work before I can finish it, and I just don't want to go there again. Not sure what to do. Edit. Words. Edit too. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your advice and support. It's really good to know I'm not imagining things. I mean, I never liked this guy from the start, but for the sake of keeping neighborly peace I was willing to be polite. Not anymore, he can go F himself. Also, I failed to mention that yesterday was the first time I'd been in the house in 10 days. First day back at do-it-yourself, he comes right over to pull this shit. Makes it even more creepy. Part 2. Thank you again for all your advice, it really helped crystallize what was going on. So, a brief update. I haven't been to the house alone since all this happened, with the aggressive banging on the door and extremely stocky vibes. What I did over the last few weeks, been there with my husband to clear out my tools, possessions etc. Hired a handyman to finish the repairs, not exactly cheap but well worth it. Remotely managed the repairs via email, checked on the place with husband. Place looks good. On the first visit back, accompanied by my husband, I saw to my dismay that the neighbor's car was parked in the shared driveway. Evidently he had the Friday off. It was snowing, it was 8 am, and it was very cold. I.e. Not a time to casually pop out of the house in a t-shirt and pretend to shovel a few measly feet of snow around the front door. Nevertheless, as we pulled into the driveway and got out of the car, naturally the front door of the neighbor's house flies open, and of course the creep jumps out in a t-shirt, it was like 25 female, to wave hi. 
Why he felt the need to do this I have no idea. My husband summed it up perfectly, what a twat he said in a low voice. Otherwise, haven't seen the neighbor since. There's still a little final work to do on the house, and when the time comes I'm just gonna sell it. It's just too creepy a neighborhood or town. Thanks again for confirming my bad gut feeling. Stay sexy and stay safe everyone. My neighbor Jack adopted a border collie two weeks ago. At least, that's what I thought. Now I'm not so sure. I first saw Toto out on a walk. He was sniffing some of the flowers growing next to the sidewalk as Jack waited, scrolling through his cell phone. Wow. You got a dog. I called out, waving. I certainly did. His name's Toto. Border Collie Mix. Toto stopped sniffing the flowers and glanced up at me. I'd encountered many dogs on this street, and they ran the whole gamut of dog greetings, from curious sniffs to protective growling to jumping up and licking my face. None of them just stared at me like Toto did. Wow, he's beautiful. And so big for a collie mix. I began to crouch down. Can I pet him? Oh, actually he's a little shy, Jack said. Having a little trouble adapting, you know? But I'm sure he'll warm up in a few days. He tugged gently on the leash. Come on, Toto. I watched as they walked away from me. The next time I saw Toto, I was dropping something off for Jack. He'd let me his drill for a home improvement project and I'd never returned it. But when I rang the doorbell, I didn't hear the usual barking I did with other dog owners. Instead, just the pat-pat-pat of feet against wood. And then Toto's face was in the glass inside of the door, staring out at me. Not barking or growling or pawing at the door. Just. Staring. Before I could think anything of it, Jack's footsteps sounded through the hall, and the door swung open. Hey Amir. Just wanted to give you this back. Oh, thanks. Hey, why don't you come in? I'm just about to pull some cookies out of the oven. Jack was an avid baker, and I couldn't say no to his cookies. I stepped inside and followed the warm cinnamon smell to the kitchen. Toto followed behind me. But I could tell something was. Off. I don't have a dog, but I have a lot of friends with dogs. And we can always tell the dog is coming our way when we hear that mistakable clicking sound of its nails against the floor. It was instinctual at this point, hear that sound and scarf down the last bit of steak, or put the chocolate out of reach, or get ready to get licked on the face. This dog. Didn't make that sound. No clicking of nails against the wooden floor. Just. Sort of a dull thump, thump, thump with each step. I glanced back at Toto. And I realized his movements were a little odd, too. His steps were a little jerky, a little stiff, a little clumsy for a dog of his build. He wasn't limping or anything, just, overall, the movements didn't look quite right. Hope you like snickerdoodles, Jack said, pulling the tray out of the oven. Wow. They look amazing. My Nana's recipe, he said proudly. Ate these every day after school. Fond memories. I picked up a cookie and took a bite. But I had an audience. Toto was staring at me. Well, that wasn't weird. Dogs love to stare at people food. I was just about to ask Jack if these cookies were safe for dogs, but his phone went off. Oh, sorry man, gotta take this. He muttered as he disappeared down the hall and into the office. I sat down at the kitchen table. Toto didn't move, just stared at me from across the kitchen. Weirdly, he wasn't licking his lips or anything as he stared hungrily at the cookie in my hand. You're a weird dog. But I like you, I said. The dog continued to stare. I'm sorry I can't give you any cookie. I don't know if they're safe. More staring. You're going to like it here. It's a good neighborhood. He canted his head. And as he did, I realized there was something off. Something about the way the light bounced off his fur. It was a little too shiny, a little too perfectly groomed, for a rough and tumble collie dog. I squinted at him, studying him. And then I heard something. A quiet, rushing sound. Like a whisper. And I guess I must have been imagining it, but it almost sounded like. God, it almost sounded like someone whispering. Help me. I stared at the dog. Sorry about that. Jack said, wandering back in. I just had to take that, it was a new client, and we're trying to keep him. How do you like the cookies? They were amazing, I said, standing up. But I've got to go. Mandy and the girls will be back from softball anytime now, and I'm supposed to have dinner ready. Oh, dinner duty, huh? He motioned at the snickerdoodles. Take some back with you. 
Say you made them from scratch. Mandy knows I can't bake like that. But, thanks. I stepped out the front door, waving back at Jack and Toto. Jack waved, grinning. The dog just stared at me, as usual. But this time, his black, glassy eyes sent chills down my spine. I swear. There's something messed up about that dog. The girls were asleep, and Mandy and I were enjoying some much-needed quality time. We sat on the couch with a bottle of wine, an episode of The Office in the background as we talked about our days. Mandy was surprisingly interested in the story. So you've never heard him bark? No. And he walks weird? And just. Stares at you? Yup. She shook her head, laughing. That does sound really weird. Even weirder than Aunt Polly's dog. Remember her? Is that the one that makes the weird screeching sound? Yeah. We laughed about it, hung out some more, and then eventually went to sleep. But even an hour after Mandy had fallen asleep, around midnight, I was lying wide awake. Thinking about that dog. And then I decided to do something really stupid. I probably never would have done it, if I hadn't drunk three glasses of wine. But with liquid courage, I crept downstairs, and slipped out of the house. The lights were still on in Jack's house. When I got there, I ducked behind his hydrangea and peered into the window. Golden light spilled into the living room from the kitchen. Jack was sitting on the couch, looking at his laptop. Toto was lying on the floor, his black eyes glittering in the low light. Surprisingly, he didn't seem to detect my presence at all. After several minutes, Jack shut the laptop and disappeared down the hallway. Toto watched him, but didn't follow. I was about to go back home. And then I saw it. Toto stood up. And then, using the couch to balance himself, he stood up again. He was standing on two legs. I watched with wide eyes as he walked into the kitchen. Stood in front of the refrigerator. And then, a small opening appeared, smack dab in the middle of Toto's chest. A human hand came out. It grasped the refrigerator door, pulled it open. Greedily grabbed some food off the shelf. Then the dog sat back down on the floor, cross-legged, and the hand, holding a leftover sandwich, disappeared into the hole. I stared through the window, my heart pounding in my chest. It's a costume. There's. A person. In there. I hightailed it out of there. Wrapped myself in blankets and lay next to my wife, wide awake, thoughts rolling through my head. I didn't expect to fall asleep. But I must have, because the next thing I knew, a loud noise woke me from a deep sleep. Knocking. Someone was knocking on my front door. Bleary-eyed, I hobbled down the stairs. I looked through the peephole, and saw Jack. Standing on my front porch. Looking incredibly angry. I don't know what he wants. But I think he knows that I know. That for some reason, he's keeping what appears to be a full-grown man in his house, wearing a dog costume and pretending to be a dog. Because when I went over there that night, still tipsy from the wine. I totally forgot he has security cameras. Part 2. I decided to ignore Jack. Since I knew he was keeping a man in his house dressed as a dog, I figured that was my safest bet. Besides, it was almost 2 AM. He'd just assume I was asleep, right? I know you're in there, Amir. Open up. He sounded angry. Really angry. I shrunk against the door, holding my breath, trying not to make a sound. Amir. He knocked for a few more minutes. Then, finally, I heard his footsteps retreat off the porch. I stood there for several more minutes, in case he came back. Then I checked all the locks and crept back upstairs. For the rest of the night I tossed and turned, trying to figure out what to do. I should just call the police. But what if it's... consensual? What if that man, for whatever reason, agreed to pretend to be Jack's dog? Does he self-identify as a dog? Is it a furry thing? But then I thought of how angry Jack sounded. And when dawn broke, I called the cops. They didn't believe me at first. But finally they agreed to go over to Jack's and check it out. I ran over to the living room window and parted the blinds, staring out across the street at Jack's house. By the time the police car pulled up, I could hear Mandy's steps above me. But I remained glued to the window. Watching. Two officers, a tall woman and a plump man, exited the vehicle and stepped up onto the porch. I saw the woman raise her fist and knock. I waited, holding my breath. But as the door cracked open, I heard it, clear as day barking. Jack began talking to the officers, his expression darkening. And then a blur of brown and white fur shot out. My jaw dropped as the dog leapt up onto the officers. A pink tongue shot out and it began licking them, letting out happy yelps. 
No. It was a real dog. It had to be. It was considerably smaller than the two officers, no way an adult man could fit in there. And it was barking, and licking, and jumping around. The dog suit I'd seen yesterday hadn't even been able to open its mouth. What are you doing? I turned around to see Mandy there, staring at me. Oh, ah. Uh. I sat down and explained everything to her that happened last night. But I could tell, she didn't believe me. I couldn't really blame her, after all, she could see a very live, very real dog jumping around Jack and the police officers. So you're saying you think? In the middle of the night. He let the dog man go and adopted a real one? I know it sounds crazy but. It does sound crazy. And you shouldn't go calling the cops on our neighbors, unless something really bad is happening. If our house is on fire, or if someone breaks in, you think Jack is gonna wanna help us? But, I saw it. It was a person. I swear. You were drunk. You probably just saw the dog jumping up while Jack was behind him or something, so it looked like a hand sticking out. Mandy, I swear. She shook her head and walked out of the room. Soon after, the officers came by and confirmed it. Jack was in possession of a large, very friendly, 100% real collie dog. That son of a bitch, I whispered, staring out the window as they pulled away. I knew the truth. Even if everyone else thought I was crazy, I know what I saw. That's why, later that night, when I saw Jack's car pull out, I snuck out of the house and crept into his backyard. Now that I remembered the security cameras, I was careful to forge a path that avoided them. But as soon as I stepped up onto the deck. Arf. 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 The collie was scratching at the back door, barking at me. Shh, I tried the door. Locked, of course. Swearing, I made my way around to the side door. It was locked too. I'll have to try tomorrow. Maybe I can come over for more cookies. I asked the police to keep my name out of the whole thing. Maybe he isn't certain it was me. I shook my head. Yeah, right. Of course he knows it was me. I started towards the front of the house. Thump. I turned around. A rattling, metallic sound, and then, thump. It was coming from the basement. I ran over to the Bilko doors. They were locked, but with a padlock. Thankfully, I had a pair of bolt cutters in my garage. I crept back home, grabbed the bolt cutters, and made my way back into the yard. With a swift downward motion, snap. The door was unlocked. I lifted the door open. Two black, glinting eyes stared back at me. It was him. The man in the dog suit, sitting in the center of the basement. A collar wrapped around his neck, the chain fastened to one of the support holes. I grabbed the bolt cutters and ran down the stairs. I'm going to get you out of here, I whispered, rushing towards him. No reaction. He just stared at me, still as a statue, his plastic dog fur shining in the light from the one bare bulb on the ceiling. A chill crept over me. Why wasn't he? Reacting more? He didn't have to act like a dog anymore. Jack wasn't around. Why wasn't he calling for help? Or thanking me? Or something? Why was he just? Staring at me. Through the dog suit? I crouched on the cold cement floor, positioning the bolt cutters across the chain. I'm going to set you free. Hold still. Zyvip. A hand shot out of the dog's chest, and grabbed me by the arm. Hey! But the hand only tightened around my bicep. I tried to tug free, but the nails dug into my skin. Let me go, I shouted, but the hand was pulling me in. Towards the dog's lifeless, glassy eyes, the plastic nose, the painted mouth. And then I heard something. A whisper. Behind you. I whipped around and my blood ran cold. A silhouette sat perched above the basement's doors, peering down at us. Jack. I grabbed the bolt cutters and squeezed. Snap. The chain broke in two. The dogman leapt up and, with amazing speed for wearing a heavy costume, bounded up the stairs towards Jack. But Jack was too fast, before he could slip past, he grabbed the dog by the arms and pushed him back down the stairs. Thump, thump, thump. He was still at the bottom. I grabbed the bolt cutters and ran up the steps. In one quick motion, I swung them at Jack. He ducked. You don't know what you're doing, Amir. You don't know the whole story. You're keeping a guy locked in your basement and forcing him to wear a dog costume. I raised the bolt cutters. Amir, just listen to me. He's not who you think he. Thwack. The bolt cutters hit the side of his head. Not that hard. I wasn't swinging to kill. But Jack crumpled to the ground, clutching his head, groaning in pain. And in that moment, 
I bounded down the stairs and grabbed one of the dogman's paws. Here, come on, quick, I whispered, pulling at the fake paw. Slowly, he rose. One human hand popped out of his chest. Then a second. I helped him undo the clasps on the belly, and under the arms, then, the costume slowly crumpled away from him. Then I was staring at an adult man, taller than myself, wearing a border collie mask. But he didn't reach up to pop off the mask. No. He just stood there, absolutely still. Staring down at me with those lifeless, glassy dog eyes. Plastic brown fur shining in the light. Something about this felt. Wrong. I backed away. Backed up the steps and out onto the lawn. His eyes never left mine, he turned his head, slowly, to watch me go. And then, when I'd gotten about 10 feet from the basement door, he bolted up the steps and ran across the lawn, for the woods. But when he got to the tree line, he stopped. He turned around. Slowly pulled off the mask. And then he was staring at me, grinning with a smile of yellowed, rotten teeth. Thank you, he whispered. And then he disappeared into the darkness. But I couldn't move. Couldn't breathe. Because I recognized that face. I'd seen it on the news. A man who'd been convicted of stalking and murdering three women. Who then escaped from prison, earlier this year. And the pieces clicked into place. His name. If I remembered correctly, it was Sam Baker. And Jack, he was Jack Baker. Jack slowly pulled himself up, groaning in pain. Amir, he said, staring into my eyes. Did you just set my brother free? Slash prosody slash speak. I recently moved to South Dakota for work, and last week my co-workers and I decided to drive down to Badlands National Park in an attempt to catch the Aurora Borealis. It didn't end up showing up, unfortunately. We arrived around 8 p.m. and stayed until 1 a.m., so it was pitch black the entire time we were there. Everything was fine until four of us decided to take one of our cars to look at a herd of bison that usually hung out several miles down the road. We didn't end up finding any, save for a couple of stray bulls, but that's besides the point. We ended up turning around to rejoin the others, and on the way back we saw something strange. Well, more accurately, everyone else but me saw it. This is a recurring theme and part of the reason I hesitated to share this story. However, while I cannot back it up myself, multiple people saw the same thing at different times, without discussing it with each other, and their reactions seemed genuine. As we sped over a hill, the other three people in the car with me started freaking out. They started asking each other whether anyone else saw what they saw, and verifying exactly what it was they spotted. They all agreed, a tall, pale pink humanoid figure had sprinted across the road in front of us, almost too fast to see. I was skeptical, and if this had been the only sighting I would honestly have thought nothing of it. The others were still a bit freaked out though, for the entire rest of the drive. Once we'd rejoined the rest of our classmates, things seemed normal for about an hour, we were just hanging out, looking at the stars and enjoying each other's company. However, a car drove down one of the roads near us, and the person next to me stared at the car and went holy shit. What's that? She kept her gaze on it, and relayed it to us afterwards. Please note, we hadn't talked about what we saw in the car once we arrived back at the campsite, she said she had seen the same figure sprinting across the street in front of the other car, and had kept an eye on it in the dark. She also stated it had moved so fast it had traveled down the road in a mere few seconds. At this point, we were all thoroughly creeped out. The people who'd been in the car with me relayed our story about the figure that ran in front of our car. They agreed that they'd seen the same being, and we all kept our eyes out for the rest of the time we were there. I do intend to head back there sometime, against my best instincts, perhaps, to see if I can catch a glimpse of it myself and I'll update this if I ever end up doing so. I used to live on the reservation, pretty much in the middle of no nowhere. The closest house was 5 miles away so truly. 
My mom and I were driving home one night and as we were nearing our house we almost hit this massive wolf as it strolled slowly in front of the car, walked across the road, and then glanced at us before walking slowly away into the darkness. It was probably three times the size of a normal wolf. Later on my mom said it was because they released a bunch of Canadian wolves into Yellowstone but it was too massive. It also had really patchy hair like it had mange or something. Its joints stuck out at weird sharp angles, its eyes were glowing, not like reflecting light but literally glowing red. It wasn't afraid of the car at all, most animals would have at least hustled, this one basically walked lazily away. And then a few days later I was in the kitchen making breakfast. I went to the sink to wash my hands and as I looked out the window into our backfield I saw a man standing a few hundred yards away. He was wearing a pelt over his head and face but I didn't recognize the animal, he was naked and covered in blood splatters. He raised his hand and pointed towards our barn and when I looked it was in flames. We lost an entire litter of piglets, several lambs, and our barn. My stepdad ran and trying to get as many animals out as he could and ended up getting serious burns on his back. Anyways when I tried to tell my grandpa about the man and he said there were spirits on our land who couldn't move on because they were murdered and buried there but they weren't evil. He thinks it was just a harmless spirit telling me the barn was on fire but I know what it was something else, something vile and I think they were connected. Do with that what you will. I have some other weird stuff from living out there. When I was 16 years old, I came face to face with a pair of big, bright orange eyes. Whatever it was that I saw seemed to be a large owl, but all I saw was darkness surrounding the eyes. This happened in the middle of the night, at my friend's house, as three of us were returning from sneaking out of the house. I was the last one to climb back in through the first story window of my friend's house. When I turned to close the window something with orange eyes was staring right at me, no more than two feet away. The eye contact between us lasted maybe three seconds, but I'm not sure how the eye contact broke. Whatever it was had a paralyzing effect putting my two friends right to sleep, and putting me to sleep soon after. This was around 10 years ago and I never really put that much deep thought into it until recently. Anyone with any insight is much appreciated. So I made the decision to spend the night in the Sierra Nevada with my girlfriend. I had only ever been there twice, although I had spent my whole childhood fishing and hunting. I've spent a lot of time in the high Sierras across the Icehouse region, but I've never seen any strange or paranormal activity there. I've seen and heard lots of bears, mountain lions, coyotes, and other creatures, but my girlfriend and I were watching a movie that we had downloaded on the laptop the other night when we heard a mountain lion cry. Female mating call, and I don't believe it's a huge deal. It's late, so I get out the flashlight, start shouting, and become loud to frighten it away, I also carry a 9mm. More cries and a roar accompany its reappearance. When I finally got my light on it, it was utterly dead, or, frozen. I fired the tree next to it from about 40 feet away to attempt to frighten it away, but it made not a single move. I then told my girlfriend to open the vehicle and get in. But at that moment, we were unable to locate the keys. In order to assist her with the keys, I shifted the spotlight. It screamed once again, this time around 25 feet away. It continued to scream an inch closer as I fired another bullet. We locate keys and jump I was in the vehicle, but my wallet and phone were both in the tent, so after rounding up some balls to retrieve them, I hopped out and cautiously walked backwards towards the tent, and as soon as I got there, it screamed again. I yelled at it, and this time it screamed much closer. So get back in the vehicle. As soon as I did, the mountain lion stopped moving. There were also deer up on the ridge behind us that were untouched by the gunshots, and the bugs didn't stop buzzing. We spent the night in my vehicle in a parking lot. If anybody could help, I'd appreciate it. In addition, 
a mountain lion that seemed to be healthy was unfazed of gunfire. In all my life, I've never seen an animal that I had to frighten away or flee from the sound of a pistol. Me and my mom go on avid bike rides literally every night we hang out. Not too long ago last weekend she had an encounter, she was riding her bike with her headphones in down a very dark and open area of the trail when she saw movement and heard what sounded like a loud yell. No people camp in that area due to the shrubs being practically non-existent and the trees are dead as well. She described it to me as the most she's ever feared for her life. Now this weekend we were coming back from our nightly ride and I started getting a gut-wrenching feeling while passing a certain place on the trail. I could genuinely feel something watching us. All the hair on my body stood up and just told me to get the hell out of there as quick as possible while she tried to take her sweet time until she saw eyes in the distance. Naturally I look at the tree line just to be cautious and me having the brightest light get the best look at it. I can't even describe what I saw all I knew was to get out of there at that moment. Hello. I'm 21 years old and I have a deep feeling and suspect that I have been being hunted by Wendigo slash dogmen ever since I was around 12 years old and I'll go into as deep as I possibly can about the whole backstory and why I think this in a moment here but first I want to explain some things. I've had encounters all my life, all horrible and horrifying, and I even had initially suspected aliens or alien abduction just because it's so hard for someone to wrap their mind around the whole possible existence of cryptids and inhuman beings. So here are the number one things that I experienced during, before and after I have encountered these things or even felt them come near. Burning, raging and powerful fear that grows as I think about the possibility of them being around. Tapping at my windows, scratches at the door as if my dog is trying to get inside but I open it with nothing there to be seen. Feeling like I am not alone or safe in my own home or my mind at certain times, specifically night time, always night time. The fear and the feeling of an entity being around has even caused me at some times in my life to just accept that I had to sleep in the daylight and awake at night so I could be careful and protect myself somehow dreams of them. Not often, but very powerful and vivid nightmares of them. I haven't had one in a long time but usually when I do, it's of me lost in a very dark forest being pursued by something, having one look through my window and just stare at me the whole duration of my dream. For your information when I had this dream of one of these things at my windows, my brother had the same dreams and actually awoke just before me by a very loud and raspy scream he thought came from said window. Yes we woke at relatively the same time in the middle of the night as well as shared somewhat the same dream. Rapid heartbeat and anxiety, stress when thinking or speaking of them like I am now. Waking up with scratches that couldn't have been done by me, aka in places I cannot reach or something like that. Even weird and scary as F light anomalies near my windows. I'll explain as best I can. My bedroom window is facing our backyard which faces a very deep woods that encompasses the whole backyard and sides of the house. So in the middle of the night, it looked as if car headlights or even this very still moving flashlight looking light floating past my window, no bouncing, no shakiness, just this very still, Bright calm light that cam through the blinds once or twice as if someone or something walked by or was trying to see inside. I ran out to my mother and father who told me nobody was outside, and they checked for me and there was no sign of anyone or anything. Paranoia. Extreme excessive sweating and extreme feelings of heat, like a fever when the fear sets in or when I feel one near. And now, I'll try my best to tell every story that I have. Please be kind and supportive, because saying all this for the public or even in general is so hard and causes me great fear but I know it may help or I could get some advice or help somehow. So. Here it goes. Alright it all starts around the time I was 9 years old, maybe 10 or 11. Around this time I started to naturally astral project and keep in mind I have always been extremely sensitive to what others cannot see feel or understand and I've always been like this. 
I remember specifically one week that my family and I had a road trip up to Fergus Falls. We live in Minnesota aka the home of these creatures besides Canada of course. It took about three hours to get there, but it was worth it, even as a fidgety kid. I loved when we got there even if it meant such a long period of being cramped and cooped up in a small car. We would go up to visit and stay with my grandparents, in this beautiful cabin that they had a timeshare for a while for. It had this gong-like bell that you'd ring when you got there that was near the parking area and entrance, and after this, there were wood pathways that spanned about 60 feet from the dirt road where you parked to the actual home and the sliding glass doors and everything. It was such a beautiful place, we would always immediately go fish because there were always sunfish that loved the corn we would bait our hooks with, usually just throwing them back but sometimes eating them and all that jazz. It was such a soothing and amazing place to be as a child, especially as one that was anxious, abused and bullied. But it always changed at night. One very vivid memory, is this one. We had gotten to the cabin, and I was immediately sick as if I had the flu all of a sudden when we got there. I wasn't car sick. We had spaghetti for lunch and I had to lay on the couch while my whole family went out to fish without me. I was in agony. A migraine, nausea, etc. and I had started to get so bad that I stumbled out through the sliding glass door to the deck, leading to the dock where they were fishing. Halfway there, I fell to my knees and threw up all of the noodles I had eaten and yelled for help and they carried me inside, thankfully feeling only kind of better after vomiting. The rest of the night was a huge blur honestly but I started to feel better as time passed. Once nightfall and darkness came, my grandparents actually put in an X-Files VHS and for some reason, no idea why? Like no idea at all, as we watched, for some reason I started to get that burning, aching and debilitating fear come in the pit of my stomach, I think because it was the subject of cryptids and aliens etc that was the first time in my life I had ever felt that kind of fear, never ever in my little life had I felt something like it before. As if I was close to feeling that there was something near, something that I didn't understand and something that the house walls would not protect me from if needed. And sadly, as they got done watching, I was feeling so much dread knowing it was time for bed because I knew I would not be able to sleep for some odd reason, again, as if I knew something was or would watch me when I was in bed. It was so bad that I had to have my mother come sleep with me and even then I could. Not sleep. For the life of me. I remember seeing things but not clearly, through windows and the spotlight windows on the ceiling. That's mostly the end of that one. But I have much more. I'll only tell one more of my stories because telling them is causing me to become numb with anxiety and fear seeping in. I was at my other grandparents' home at the time, that I must state that their home is on what used to be Lakota slash Suix land, even adjacent to what is called the Sioux Line Trail. I was living there actually while doing online school and I would have the same. Exact feelings come at night but much worse and more powerful, once night came specifically. So, my bedroom door was to my right, closest to the wall I was facing and the bed faced. And right outside my bedroom door, if you took two sharp lefts and walked just a few feet there would be a back door. I thought that in this bout of burning fear, I heard the doorknob rattle or even the door open even if it was locked. Nobody was up, I would have heard and seen them through the angle of my bedroom door. I confirmed it in the morning that nobody was up at that time. This all happened in the span of maybe just one or two minutes. After I thought I heard this occur, I felt a presence right on the other side of that wall, between me and the back door. The fear somehow grew to an amount I couldn't fathom. And then, so slowly, too slowly, I heard what sounded like a large nail being softly and very creepily slowly dragging across that wall. The sound leading as if it was coming towards my bedroom door, and as the sound got closer, I closed my eyes and started to say prayers are loud, crying and almost peeing my pants because of how scared I was that I might see something peeking at me around that damn bedroom door. It stopped once it got to the end of this wall. I didn't see it, after holding my eyes shut, crying and begging God and Jesus to protect me. 
And I am not religious but this made me that afraid, I never saw it or its face, it left or disappeared. And I somehow fell asleep. No idea how, told myself it was my mind and that it wasn't real, maybe I was sleeping but I knew I wasn't. I have insomnia so I know when I am sleeping and when I'm not. If this gets some attention I will post the rest of my stories and encounters, but until then. I need to stop focusing on these things. Please let me know what you think, any comments or something would help me a lot in feeling less alone and like I'm not crazy. I've had experiences like this happen too much and too often through my life to be just my mind or just anything else. Does my experiences sound valid and concrete? If you e had encounters or heard of people with them, do they have similarities? I just want to feel safe again. Hey folks, for years now I've been retelling a childhood experience to various friends to see if anyone has dealt with something similar. When I was probably 10-11 I was playing in a lower pasture on 80 acres of family land situated in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California with a friend and my little brother. Both were around 7 eighths at the time, I remember vividly seeing a man standing just inside the woodline with the head of a stag. Dark, rough fur stopped at the collarbone and it has an enormous rack that resembled somewhat the way tree roots look when they're blown over and pull out of the ground. Its chest was white-skinned, muscular but athletic and it had what I remember looking like stripes painted on it in a dark color. Not stripes like a prison uniform but occasional long marks running down an arm or from front to back. I don't remember exactly what its legs looked like, either covered in the same dark fur or wearing dark pants. Normally I'd chalk it up to childhood fantasy but my little brother and his friends swear they saw it too. Any similar experiences? It seemed more neutral in temperament than aggressive so I'm reluctant to really label it a skinwalker I've also had folks compare it to Kerninos. Me and my family are indigenous Native American, and we had family in Arizona, while visiting them my brother and some older cousins decided to explore the area more. Me being around 6 to 7 at the time of course wanted to join my cool older brother and cousins but they said it was for big kids and I was too young to join them. Around a few hours later we got a frantic call from my brother and cousins telling our mom to come pick them up now and they'll explain later. I wanted to see why mom was hurrying so I tagged along, note we had a van so a lot of people could sit in it. When we got to the meeting point my brother and cousins were all shaking and covered in mud. And my mom was mad his brand new white jays were covered in mud. He explained that they went to a construction site and they saw what looked like a teenage girl on one of the sand piles. They started calling to it and suddenly it turned into a shadow and started running away. They chased after it and threw mud at it. It turned into an owl and then flew into a tree. One of my cousins said dude it's a skinwalker. That's when the realization kicked in and everyone scattered and bolted. My mom was even angrier now, saying that they were stupid for wanting to provoke one. Long story short we had to smudge and get out of there quickly. So thanks to my brother our Arizona trip was cut short. Don't know how to start this story, happened to me literally 3 hours ago and I just want to know what I witnessed. I was outside smoking on my porch around 12 am midnight. It was completely silent outside not a single sound, and up in the forest I suddenly hear the trees start to shake like crazy and some seconds after I heard a shriek that was kind of similar to a cat screaming but a lot deeper, there was very little light but I could just make out the trees moving. Then I hear this thing sprinting like crazy on all fours, I could feel and hear the fast steps it took so I assume this thing is really heavy. It ran across the field next to the neighboring house in literally under 2 seconds and it's over 100 meters between us. I'm from Norway and there is some wildlife here but I have never seen or heard something scream or run like this. It was unnaturally fast, it scared the shit out of me. Anybody have any idea what this could have been, I did not see the creature.
I have a very close personal friend who has lived within a mile of the Navajo Indian Reservation in Utah, and has related the following story to me. His family had been going to visit relatives in another city, and to get there, they drive through a stretch of Indian Reserve territory. It was in the early evening, and his mom was riding in the passenger seat asleep, as were most of the rest of his family, he actually thought they all were asleep, while he drove. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught motion coming from the driver's side shoulder of the road, and what he saw startled him to say the least. It was about 5 feet 11 to 6 feet 2, naked, and hairless. It was keeping pace with him, approximately 45 miles per hour, and seemed to exude a sense of hatred towards them. He floored the van, 97 Chevy Astro van all-wheel drive extended, and quickly went to about 100 miles an hour. The skinwalker kept up with him until about 60, and then simply stopped running. He didn't mention this to his family seeing as how they might think he was crazy, until his younger sister, 7-ish, mentioned the same thing to him and his mom. She described it accurate to his memory, and even described how he, her brother, had sped up to get away from it. Their mother told her it was just a dream, and not to worry. My friend knows it wasn't a dream, and knows he isn't crazy. According to what I can find, a skinwalker is essentially nothing more than a witch doctor slash medicine man gone evil, and as such are attributed all sorts of mystical powers and abilities. However, they need the skin of an animal to get their abilities. He heard stories from some of the Navajos at high school of skinwalkers that were smooth-skinned, hairless and exist simply to cause pain. I was wondering if anyone has any more stories, doesn't matter how far removed from the source they are, about these smooth skinwalkers. I was in the woods with one of my friends and we were just playing tag and everything like that. We saw a huge rock so we walked over and sat on it and when I looked down I saw two little carvings, they were really cool so I handed one to my friend and that when we hear a grunt. Me and my friend turned around to see a dog, I am a huge dog lover so I called it over, but that's when I looked at its eyes I was in horror, they're looking right at me was the biggest eyes in the world I screamed and the dog just lay there on the ground looking at me. Let me explain what I am talking about the biggest eyes. Go to a bathroom mirror and try to open your eyes as big as you can, that's what the eyes look like. Me and my friend still had the little carved people I was holding it as tight as I can and when I moved it the dog got up but not on four legs just two, it moved back and forth like it had a hard time keeping upright, me and my friend were petrified with fear. The thing then says something and runs I mean runs like a human but the thing it said was this, not food. Even since then my mom and dad won't let me in the woods and what they told me next made me never even want to go in there here as their little pep talked. Honey what you saw was something called a skinwalker, they kill their beloved ones and turn into a monster, they can turn into any animal they want but to know how to know is their eyes. They will always have huge eyes looking at you. They then gave me the little craved person and told me to keep it with me until I moved out. I am still with my mother and father and I have to carry the little carved person with me because it will keep me safe if I don't. My boyfriend and I recently went camping at Red River Gorge in Kentucky. Our first night we were there, we were hanging out in our tent, when all of a sudden we starting hear this really weird noise. It was really loud and almost sounded like someone humming but in pain at the same time. It had recently rained really hard and a lot of places were flooded so there wasn't many people camping that night and not to mention we were pretty deep in the woods so I don't think it was an actual person. Fast forward to a sleeping, I thought I was dreaming that someone or something was outside our tent trying to get in. The next night my boyfriend asked me if I remember waking him up to tell him someone was outside of the tent. I don't, but he heard what sounded like a fingernail being run across the tent. I wish I would have recorded the noise that his was making but I was so terrified I didn't even think about it. My boyfriend just thinks it was a coyote but I've heard plenty of coyotes in my lifetime and I've never heard them sound like that. 
It sounded like so much like a person but in a weird way as if it was a recording. Last week my fiancé and I were out looking at the meteor shower out on a really secluded dirt road. We heard a very strange snort and then a human voice say hey needless to say we got the f out of there asap. The rest of the night I kept having shivers go up my spine. About another week goes by without anything happening. So last night I decided to out fishing with a few friends. We were out there for probably about an hour drinking and having fun when my one buddy said he swears he heard somebody cough across the river. We were on private property pretty deep into some woods so no one should have been around. We kind of just ignored it and continued doing what we're doing since he's the only one that heard it. Then we heard a branch snap like it was stepped on, but it had to have been a fairly thick branch because it got all of our attention real quick. After that one of my buddies claims to have seen two bright white lights up in a tree and he said when he looked into it he immediately started tearing up and felt uncomfortable. We also just had this really uncomfortable feeling that I can't really describe. Sorry for all the errors and mistakes beforehand I wrote this quickly on my phone. I just need to some insight. So living in a small town, central Pennsylvania, I drive around with friends quite a bit to pass time. Tonight a group of friends and I were driving around when one of them needed to go home due to an emergency. We took her back to her car, which was parked at a local softball field, and since it was dark I decided to park my car facing hers and leave my headlights on to make sure she could see to get in her car. While we're sitting in my car waiting, the four of us who were still hanging out simultaneously spot a light. It looked like a large flashlight moving between the fences of the two fields. I was worried it was a random person, which is still scary nonetheless. So I beeped my horn and motioned for my friend to leave, which she started backing out. So I drove back up to the main road. When we turned onto the road, we realized she was stopped in the parking lot, now facing sort of diagonally towards the road. Given what we just saw, I stopped the car to watch her leave to make sure she got out of there okay. And when we looked towards her car, once again all four of us in my car saw what looked like two figures walking right in front of her car. They were tall, skinny, and none of us recall being able to make out full bodies, only something vaguely human-like. Right as the figures walk out of the headlights, our friend continues to back her car up. and she swings her lights in the direction that the figures walked. It couldn't have taken more than a second for her to back up, but the figures were gone. We called her and got her to meet us a few miles down the road at a store and we asked her if she saw the same thing, and she saw absolutely nothing. I'm not sure if it was ghosts or what it was, but I'm very creeped out. I think it's worth mentioning that said friends were cracking jokes about skinwalkers all night. which i am aware that you are not supposed to mention them when i was about 8 years old i used to take a bus to school at around 6 in the morning and there was a forest nearby that my parents my dog and i were all familiar with it wasn't difficult to memorize but when i was about 11 months old i was looking at the forest as usual it was cold and i thought i saw something white in the entrance to the forest however it didn't move instead it just looked at me and howled it just made a high pitched sound before disappearing i haven't seen it again my friend and i have never experienced something like this before in our entire lives recently My mom had to go to an old high school friend's birthday party. It was convenient for us to go because a family friend has a farmhouse we could stay at in central Florida. My mom didn't feel comfortable going alone because the farmhouse can be really creepy at night due to the lack of light on the property and it just being in the middle of nowhere. So, I told my mom I would go with her as long as I could bring a friend. We get to the property and it is a huge 52 acre plot of land with cows, horses, and open fields with a tree line surrounding the land. 
We looked on a map to see exactly where we were and saw we were right next to two Native American forests. We unpacked our stuff and were able to check all of the property out because the owner had a golf cart type ATV. My friend saw a TikTok talking about skinwalkers and their Native American name and we didn't know any better so we were talking about them all day on all parts of the property. Later that night we saw a video talking about how even saying their name could provoke them to come. We immediately got kind of scared because we found out the party my mom was going to would be an hour away and we would be in the farmhouse at night all alone. As the sun started to set we quickly noticed that none of the windows on all four walls of the house had curtains. With the lights on in the house, you could only see your reflection from the inside but could see right in from the outside. As I said, the property had little to no light but some floodlights were motion activated on the back porch of the farmhouse. Just a quick description of the farmhouse, it was a one bedroom one bathroom house with a little living room and a kitchen. There were two doors, one leading out to the fields in the back and the other was directly attached to the horse stables which was more of a lounging area as there were tables and a bar with a giant flat screen. Okay so now we can get into the scary part of the night, my friend was putting away our dinner in the fridge and I went outside to smoke. As soon as I walked up to the table in the horse stable I heard something really close to me and ran back inside. As soon as I came back inside my friend asked if I knocked on the window. Of course, I had said no but my friend found that hard to believe as she definitely heard a distinct knocking at the window. This window is important to the story because the floodlights were right outside of it. I forgot to mention we had brought our dog and she was fine the entire day until it became dark out. When my friend and I were both inside we just brushed it off until the floodlight outside the window turned on and my dog bolted to see who was there. My dog sat there and barked at the window but when we went to go check there was nothing there. No both of us really needed a cigarette so we both decided to go outside and give it one more try. My friend stepped outside and looked to her right, I was confused and told her we should stay in the stable so we walked to a table. As soon as we sat down there were another two knocks on the other side of the building. We got up and sprinted towards the house where we locked ourselves in and where my friend told me she heard whispering coming from the right as soon as we stepped out of the house. At this point, we were really freaked out and the dog had begun to start barking at the same window again where the light turned on once again to nothing there. The only comfort we could get at this time was calling my friend's parents and some of our friends. However, after a short 10 minutes of us talking to people our service cut out and both of our calls failed. We couldn't text anyone either and this really scared us because we hadn't had a problem with our service the entire day. We once again tried to relax and put on a movie but that's when we heard something jump on the roof and walk above the room we were in. My friend and I immediately leapt up and ran to the bathroom. We didn't know what to do but at this point, I thought our best bet was to run to the car, which was at least 40 feet away, and get off the property until my mom and the owner could come back. We grabbed our stuff still hearing whatever was on the roof walk around to where we moved in the house. As soon as we got to the door my friend pushed me and said listen which is when we heard two knocks right at the door we were standing in front of. It then ran towards the back of the house where all of the floodlights on the back porch went on. The dog was going crazy and my friend and I were on the verge of tears. I told her we had to run to the car and get out of there which we did. As we were running we could hear something on the roof of the stables almost as if it was following us to the car. We sped off and sat at a parking lot two miles away for two hours until my mom and her friend returned to the property. They escorted us back in and as we were all walking through the stables to get to the door of the house there was another knocking in the stable. The owner said she heard it and went to go check what it was but saw nothing. Something my friend and I had noticed was that the sounds of the crickets were back again. When we left the house earlier that night there wasn't a sound that could be heard other than whatever was on the roof. My mom ended up sleeping there at the house but my friend and I were traumatized. We felt as though the farmhouse was peaceful again as soon we got back cause we didn't feel any of the negative energy we were feeling earlier that night. 
We were too scared to even sleep so we both sat in the bathroom on the floor apologizing for whatever we might have offended. We honestly don't know what this could have been but we don't want this post to get taken down for it being framed as a question. We have come to a conclusion of our own on what it was but thought it would be interesting to hear other people's thoughts. I live in the home state for skinwalkers. Utah is a beautiful state with ever-changing landscapes and adventures to be experienced. Recently, I stayed at my great-grandfather's cabin near Oakley. He built it on a ranch next to a beautiful forest. A couple of days ago I went out to the spring to refill our drinking water. It was around 11 p.m. As I was walking along the road with my flashlight, I noticed deer laying down in the middle of the road, its legs were flayed outwards, almost like it was a rug. Its eyes were a glowing white and it stared at me for what felt like around 5 minutes. I physically couldn't move or look away, it was almost like it had some weird energy to it. I got these horrible chills. They weren't anything like those chills you sometimes get down your spine. My entire body was pulsing. The deer bolted off and I lost the chills and went through a shortcut to the spring. I was walking back when another deer was standing upright on its hind legs. It was standing up. I tried to run but it was like when you try to run in a dream. No matter how hard I tried, I wouldn't go anywhere. I must have blacked out because I was laying down on the dirt road with a horrible headache and a nasty smell in the air. I returned to the cabin and I didn't speak of anything that happened that night for the remaining time I was there. First off, I live in the sticks. Anything that isn't road or yard is just trees, plus at certain seasons deer are about as common to see as clouds. When I was around 11 years old during the autumn I decided to take a walk beyond the fence of my backyard. There used to be a paved road there that has since broken up and is almost overtaken by grass and other plants. Being a kid, I picked up a stick and poked stuff on the ground with it. I walked for around a minute with my head to the ground before I felt the body heat of something else. Somehow I was so distracted I didn't notice at all that I was in front of a fully grown buck, but something is different about this buck. Most deers run away at the sight of almost any human. But it didn't run away here it just stood and looked down at me. I looked to the side to see if there were any more deer to its sides to see if it was protecting its family. My mind might have been playing tricks with me in the tenseness of the moment, but I remember seeing a makeshift sort of fence out of vines as if something was trying to replicate the wire fence in the front with branches and vines. I looked back at the deer, or whatever it was, and felt its breath on me. I dropped my stick and ran all the way to my room, I didn't see if it was chasing me, I didn't stop to close the gate, I just ran. I don't know if it tried to chase me, but it definitely didn't go past the fence because I would have seen it from my room's window. I have not had a significant encounter with a deer since then and I have not explored the forest again to look for the fence. This story does not have perfect proof that I encountered a skinwalker that day but it is still strange to me that an animal barely reacted to my presence. I have heard of them before, but it's never something that I have came across until now. I believe in spirituality and I can sense ghosts and other beings. I usually never seen anything other than ghosts and I try not to think of them for the most part as the more you engage in these types of contacts the more you get signs from these spiritual beings. Keep in mind I am still young and I am yet to experience a lot more in this world but this was something different. So this whole thing happened to me a couple of days ago. I was extremely anxious and angry due to a fight with my SO and I wanted to get out and have a bike around my area. I am based in the UK and I never thought I would see what I saw. First of all, I got off my bike, I was pretty out of breath and crying, and as I was walking, the bushes next to me started rattling and I sensed a quick movement towards me, so I hopped on my bike and drove away like never before. 
This couldn't have been a person as the bush is thick and if someone would have moved inside I would have heard at least a ouch as it is full of spikes and it would have been someone taller than me, which in my area is really uncommon. I am 5 feet 8. I called up a friend, he reassured me that I was fine and I eventually calmed down and he had to go back to work so we hung up and made my way home. However I heard rattling again, this time I was approximately 500 meters. 2,000 feet away from the other location. I looked inside the wooded area and first I saw nothing but I was sweating and I felt this uncomfortable feeling in my head. When I took a second glance by the very first tree branch it was there. It was extremely tall I would say almost twice the size of me, leaning onto the tree. I made eye contact? The skinwalker didn't have any distinguished features, and I heard this weird buzzing sound. So I got on my bike yet again and this time I got home within minutes, but usually from that area it would take me about 15 minutes to get home. At this point of time, I am extremely confused. I taught these being were native to North American. For all I know it wasn't something I ever seen before or felt before. Ghosts or harmful beings usually come with intention and I feel those whether it's good or bad and based on that knowledge I can send them away. But this felt extremely different. I have tried to look for more explanation on what it means to see a skinwalker, what are its intentions or why is it even here? Maybe someone could give me these answers here? Or maybe if it wasn't a skinwalker, someone could point me in the right direction? To finish off my last year of high school, I had to go to a school which was located about 10 to 15 miles away from the nearest town in Durango, Colorado. It was a boarding school and I lived there with about 30 other students and teachers. When I first got there I had never heard the term skinwalker until one of my classmates mentioned it, so I got curious and looked it up. Google made it seem like a skinwalker was just some mere joke saying it's a magical transforming creature so we would always say watch out for the skinwalkers. And nobody really took it seriously. The campus was huge, probably about 20 to 30 acres of land next to a river. About two weeks after I got there I was walking around the campus and noticed an Indian burial ground about 75 feet away from my cabin there was about 20 cabins at the whole place and each could only fit two people to live in. One night my roommate and I were up around midnight playing Call of Duty and such when we started hearing sounds of some very large animal full force sprinting into the back of our cabin multiple times, and we were freaked the F out. Our school didn't allow guns so we had no choice but to and double lock the door and close the shades. Even the night security guard came by because he thought we were walking around outside and causing a havoc at 12 am he came by about every hour to check on everyone and make sure everything was fine, he was a cool guy though. He told us he was convinced we were outside but after we told him what happened and after he saw that both of our faces were pale white, he sorta of believed us. Weird shit like this would continue to happen about once or twice a week after that for about two months, whether it was random scratches we heard on our window, or a whole bunch of lights in the middle of the field that we would see in the distance through our window, screams, whistles, etc. The people in the neighboring cabins and I would always talk about similar experiences but stopped shortly after a native that went to the school told us talking about skinwalkers, attracts them. It was getting to the point where I had no choice but to tell someone. I decided to have a meeting with my principal and talk to him about it on behalf of everyone there. What he said freaked me out. He told me back in 2010 he was working late at this school one night and as he walked out of his office, he saw someone sprinting into the cafeteria, ripping papers off the wall as it ran by he thought it was a student. He chased whatever it was into the cafeteria, which was a one-way in, one way out. Only one door. As he got into the cafeteria and turned the lights on, there was nobody there. My roommate dropped out of school about halfway through the year because of this and I couldn't find anyone else to live with in that cabin so I was forced to listen to shit like this all alone for months on end. It was absolutely messed up, I was on the verge of dropping out, but I couldn't cause I was so close to finishing my senior year. 
About three quarters through the year, our school had a quarterly thing where we go on a week-long hiking trip somewhere around the country. There was five different groups, and my group was going on a hike up Humphreys Peak in Arizona. We camped the whole way back to Colorado. It was a six-hour drive to Humphreys Peak, and the hike took most of the day. First night was not bad, and I wasn't thinking of any skinwalker shit as I haven't been bothered by them for weeks at this point. The next day we spend most of the day driving slash hiking to the next camp spot, which is a random place in the middle of the desert. Five or six miles down a trail, as we set up our hammocks and start to relax, an older aged woman in a bikini appears from behind a hill we were all at. It was very unsettling as I noticed she didn't have a water bottle, backpack or anything six miles into this trail. She proceeds to start talking to one of my teachers, and she says she knows this place well and can show him around. They start walking and everyone couldn't help but notice her walk. It was like she broke both her knees and was limping. But not limping. I can't even describe how weird of a walk she had. A couple minutes go by and my teacher returns without her, and he walks by everyone and goes straight into his tent. I didn't think too much of it but thought her walk was kind of weird. Here's where it gets interesting. Third day we finally get to Tucker Flat, after a long day of driving, and another long hike into the desert we end up on a giant rock and decide to camp there. We are in the dead middle of nowhere. It's getting dark so we have a fire, make food and shortly after go to bed, too bad I didn't sleep at all the whole night. I spent most of the night staring at the top of my tent as from what happened the night before, still thinking about that creepy old lady. It was at about 10 or 11 when we started hearing some noises that sounded like rustling at first, and then those rustles turned into footsteps, and then back into small rustles again. As my roommate and I both hear it getting closer and closer to our tent I whisper you hear that? Nearly shitting myself hoping it wouldn't hear us. He didn't answer me, so I looked over at him, and he was staring at me dead in the eyes bugging out with his knife in his hand. I grabbed mine too next to me and slowly put it to my chest. I knew what we had to do, but I didn't know if I had the balls to do it. The footsteps finally stopped. I got a sense of relief and decided it was a perfect time to open the tent and check out what was making all that noise. As I open up my side of the tent, I am greeted by a pair of eyes staring right back at me from less than a foot away. What was it? A black cat in the dead middle of the desert. At this point there was two scenarios going through my head, what the f and what the f. When my tentmate peeks his head and sees the cat, his jaw drops. How the f is a cat 5 miles into a hiking trail in the dead middle of the desert. At 11 pm? We were stumped and decided walking back to the trailhead and getting in the van was our safest bet. So we ended up walking the whole 5 to 6 mile hike back at 11 pm and slept in the van. The whole time we heard rustling behind us and whenever we used our flash, there were a pair of eyes looking at us from a distance. I ended up reading all sorts of information about skinwalkers, and a shiver went down my spine as I read that skinwalkers often turn into a small dog or cat to trick whoever they're messing with. This school was by far the most messed place I've had to live at and I thank God every day that I do not live there anymore. This is just one of the experiences I've had and it only got worse throughout the year. If you want to avoid all this shit happening to you, just don't say the word skinwalker. I'm Mexican 42, I've been reading some stories about American skinwalkers, and I realized, either skinwalkers are different in Mexico or you guys don't know nothing about them. Legends and documents have told us skinwalkers had much to do with the Mexica slash Aztec Empire Foundation. But in general SWs are people with the ability to turn into animal shape, it isn't clear how exactly, but there is more than one way to do it, according to stories I've heard, and has nothing to do with the devil and such. In Mexico, we call them by the name they were given. Nahuales, and they can transform into a wide variety of animals as early as four years old, such as snake, skunk, squirrel, turkey, 
pig, cat, dog, armadillo, horse, bull, these animals are the most common among Mexican skinwalkers, at least the one stories I know. Having an encounter with a Nawal is having a paranormal encounter, you get the same feeling. Nawales are nocturnal 100% and if they still in animal mode when the sun rise up, they die, usually in their beds. Only men can be Nawales, women don't have the energy compatibility to do so, women have a different gift. Depending on age, practice, lineage, and other qualities, is your primary animal you can transform into. If you ever have an encounter with a Nawal, your life can be in danger. Nawales are after something all the time, working they say. Nawales work on watching over the land, the cattle or herd, stalking the girls, scaring the other men or possibly opponents or they are just after enemies, stealing other people's stuff and most of the time they are just dicks. That's the reason I think Mexican Nawales and American slash Canadian skinwalkers are different. Thanks for bearing with me. So last night I apparently had a dream about a skinwalker. A little backstory is that last week I was job site sitting for a house I'm building while the owners were away. And sleeping on site while working on the house. During that time I had two severe panic attacks, then last night had the dream. So the dream plays out as one of my girlfriend's dogs who loves me was attacking me like crazy and I couldn't get him to stop. Then I realized her other dog was barking towards the outside of the building on the job site. When I looked out, there was a deer that I scared off to appease the one dog. Then the first dog continued to attack me and I realized that the deer was coming back, except upon further review, something was off. I realized I could see into its skull and it looked like a red, human face with glowing red eyes was in it. I screamed, hey, is there a person in there? Is there a person in there? Then I woke feeling like I had been screaming and had another panic attack. I thought it was just a weird dream about her dog attacking me and leading to a panic attack so I told it to her in passing because she knows about my panic attacks and tries to help with them. She asked, what was he attacking you for? So I proceeded to tell her the dream. What really creeps me out is I had really never heard of them before especially the mythology behind them. I had heard the name because I watched Skinwalker Ranch with her but I passed it off as a hoax. She went on to show me pictures and some of them looked exactly like what I saw. She then told me of the mythology around them especially how they show themselves specifically to people with Native American ties. So I told her that my dad used to take me to powwows when I was a kid because I have a very small amount of US Aboriginal blood from his side of the family. Moral of the story is I'm freaked out after doing research and wondering if this community has any advice. Me and my 15 year old daughter were driving over to a friend of hers house a little after 8 Monday night and something passed in front of the car. It looked real. My daughter said it was grey, I say it was black but it was very muscular, it was the size of a large pit bull with broad shoulders. The arm sockets looked human but the rest didn't. It had a round head. It used its front paws to run. It would push off the ground with them and they would go towards its sides and the back legs would come up and they would kind of tuck in underneath it. I know how weird it sounds. I wonder if it was a panther. It was still daylight. I thought it looked strange but I didn't want to alarm my daughter so I didn't say anything. It went beside an abandoned house on a road that runs perpendicular to the road that my home is on. She said, Mama, that wasn't a dog. I replied to her I thought the same thing, I just didn't want to say it. It ran really fast and it looked solid. I have no idea what it could be but we were talking about skin pedestrians quite a lot Sunday night. I heard that was bad luck. Who knows? I know how crazy that sounds. I'm gonna try to make this as short as possible. But, for context, 
In my bedroom I have this attic door behind my bed, and the attic itself always gives me this uneasy feeling like something's in there, especially at night, and sometimes I can hear scratching noises or noises of stuff falling in there, this never happens in the daytime though. Anyways onto the dream, tonight I had this dream and I can remember it quite vividly, it started off like any other dream I was sitting by my desk just drawing or writing I can't exactly remember, but then, remember the attic door I mentioned earlier? That door opened slightly by itself, at first I thought it might be my cat since she always goes hunting for mice and other things in the attic but then a bunny came out of there instead. For some reason, I didn't think much of it at first, but the more I looked at it the stranger I found it to be. Firstly, it didn't have any hair, on its body, like, it was straight up bald, secondly, the skin texture looked a whole lot like human skin, now, I'm not an animal expert, but it looked nothing like animal skin, third red flag was, its eyes were completely black, and it wouldn't be a red flag if they were normal black, since most animals do have plain black eyes, but no, they were pitch black, like two black holes, not reflecting light or anything. Now this thing was standing light in front of my lamp so if the eyes were supposed to reflect light, the reflection would definitely be there. In the dream I remember just staring at the thing blankly while it stared back at me. Now, what I didn't realize while I was staring at it, that its head was slowly morphing into a human head, I only realized after I snapped out of it and looked back at it, noticing that its head now resembled an expressionless human female. Her eyes were still pitch black and her body was still of a bunny but her head was completely different, she still had a blank expression and was staring at me endlessly. At that point in my dream I remember being scared shitless, I literally sprinted out of the room and all the three floors downstairs like my life depended on it. Once I was there, I immediately ran to my dad and told him what had happened, hoping that he'd at least take my story into consideration. Since whenever I tell him something weird like this, he always turns to me and asks me to show him, however in the dream, he didn't even look up at me, he just told me to stop being stupid and go back upstairs, which caught me a bit off guard. Anyways, I obeyed and started walking back upstairs, thinking that maybe if I go back and take a picture of that thing and show him then he'll believe me. As I was walking upstairs I saw a shadow walking towards the stairs, Bear in mind I couldn't yet see who the person was because of how my house is built, I didn't think much of the shadow at first, thinking that it was just my brother or sister coming down, but as I saw the person, I remember my heart literally stopping for a few moments. At the top of the stairs, was the same girl, now in her human form, standing like a ragdoll, still staring at me blankly with the same expression, except her eyes were no longer pitch black, they were like human eyes, or should I say, they were trying to be like human eyes, by that I mean, they were just like our eyes, but stretched inhumanly wide, and lacking any type of sparkle or self, they just looked dead, it was like there was nobody in those eyes, no soul, no living being. It was at this point that I woke up, the image of the feminine entity still in my head. It wasn't that scary back when I woke up, but writing about it now makes me realize, that dream was horrifying. Now, after reading all of that, can someone please tell me if there's any logical explanation for this? I really don't want to think that skinwalkers or other entities are after me but after that dream, I'm not sure what else to think. I don't know, maybe it my irrational fear of my attic and the slight fear of skinwalkers that I've developed as I've been researching them a bit these last few weeks, mixed with subconscious playing tricks on me but at this point I'm really not sure, so please, can someone at least try to give me a logical explanation for this, because I really don't want to believe that I'm in the process of getting possessed by something lol, I just need reassurance.edit, by the way I live in the UK, and, as of now, there's been barely any sightings of skinwalkers, that's what makes me doubt that it might have been a skinwalker, I'm not sure though to be honest. Edit 2. Now, I know some of y'all might be thinking is this bitch really soiling their pants because they had a nightmare? And I get it, I'd be thinking the same, but, the only reason I'm making this post, is because I have this thing, where when I have dreams, 
Half the time those dreams are actually visions of the future. What I mean by this is, half the time, my dreams end up happening in real life like a few weeks or months later, especially when they don't seem that far-fetched, so that's my only concern lol, just wanted to clear that up. So I live in the city, but I'd call myself quite an accomplished outdoorsman when I can get away from the city life. A few years ago, I loaded a bunch of camping gear onto my bicycle and spent the better part of the next seven months riding 5,300 miles, 8,500 kilometers, around the US. At night, I most often preferred to wild camp, simply finding somewhere to disappear into the woods, somewhere people were unlikely to find me and even less likely to care that I was there. It ended up being one of my favorite parts of the whole trip, just finding some secluded spot in the woods to get some much needed rest. But the forest, I quickly learned, is not a quiet place at night. There's always some form of noise. The chirping of thousands of crickets becomes a constant drone throughout the night, accompanied by many toads. There would always be at least a slight breeze through the trees, or the babbling of a nearby creek. It was always a highlight of my nights though not particularly uncommon, to hear the distant yips and howls of coyotes, and I fondly look back on the one night where two owls, one on either end of my tent, called back and forth through much of the night. After a month or so of this, I became quite accustomed to the nighttime sounds of the forest, and it became very comforting. So it was quite a shock to my system when one night in rural Montana, I realized I was struggling to sleep because of the exact opposite of what keeps most people up. That night, it wasn't the noise that was keeping me awake but rather the complete lack of any noise. It was dead silent. And that was an incredibly unnerving experience. I can only describe it as the loudest silence I've ever heard. It almost felt as if the entire forest was hiding from an equally silent predator. Suddenly the occasional snapping of a twig a common sound that would normally get lost in the cacophony of the forest, sounded like a gunshot. I slept terribly that night, and morning could not come soon enough. My grandparents live in a very rural part of Romania. So rural we didn't get flushing toilets till like, 2007. My parents were born there and I was raised as a child there so I English isn't my first language. Sorry for any mistakes. My family isn't very superstitious, we rely on more common sense more than anything. So when I would go out to see my friends in the village I would be told to try not to come home too late. There are a lot of dangerous dogs around. I pride myself on not being afraid of normal or day-to-day -day things example a dog, so I would kind of just just wave those warnings off. Summer of 2017. I was 16 years old and visiting my grandparents for the summer. It was a very hot day and everyone stayed out later in the village park than usual, maybe till around 2 am. The way back home is either I could use the main road and go down my pathway home or cut across the school's grounds and shave two minutes of my walk home. Getting there in seven minutes instead of a whopping nine. I use the shortcut. In the summer the school grounds can sometimes be used to store lumber piles. Obviously. There's no one there to use the school, why not make the most of it? Well, that summer, the neighbors facing the school were building slash fixing something. I think they're barb. So there were several large piles of wood, creating a weird zigzag enclosure thing, sorry I can't explain it any better. Anyways, in the daytime it's no problem finding your way out. But in a village in Romania where not all the streetlights are working, and no tall buildings illuminating the area, it's like being a mouse in a maze, but you're also blind. I was midway, trying to figure out whether I should just hop the school fence, if I could find it, or try to work out how to cut through the piles to get on the green to go home. I don't know how else to describe it but suddenly everything got very very still. 
There wasn't a breeze. Usually there's crickets, frogs, dogs barking etc. Everything went quiet. My hair started going up on end. It just felt wrong. There was a huge urge to turn around. I did. In the path I took across the school grounds was the biggest town I'd ever seen. It was the size of a small pony. It looked unnatural. It was a light color with darker snout and paws. I didn't even hear it coming. I should have. All of our village dogs are loud, small to mid-size, and dumb as rocks. They bark at anything. But this thing just didn't. I started sweating really bad and I got that ball of fear in your stomach that you get. It wasn't moving. Just staring straight at me. What did I do? I turned around, clenched my butt cheeks, and walked home. Granted, it was an extremely uncomfortable walk home but I did it and I survived. I asked my grandmother about it the next day. She got a very worried look and said she had no idea. Our shepherds don't use huge dogs anymore and they're usually chained to the ground. I don't take that pathway home anymore. I grew up on a large farm. 100 acres of farmland and additional 40 of woods. When I turned 17, I decided I was going to join the military the day after graduation but, I wanted to be prepared. So, I started getting up at 4.30 in the morning and running the perimeter of the property. I did this every day from June through mid-October and I was getting lean and strong and ready. I was getting to the point that I felt like I could do the run twice without exhaustion. October 17th all that changed. I started my run at 4.30 like normal. I got to the rear corner of the lot, literally the furthest point from home on my run, and I turned the corner and my right foot came down in a dugout hole. I felt my ankle break and my hip popped in a weird way that makes me want to vomit just thinking about. I collapsed in a heap falling on something sharp that cut straight through my sweatpants and into my leg and my orbital bone hitting a rock knocking me out. I woke up some time later. The only thing I can tell you is that it was still dark. I did a self-inventory, physically touching all my injuries. Hip, ankle, cut leg, smashed face. My vision in my right eye was blurry but still good. I quickly assessed that standing wasn't an option. Waiting for someone wasn't an option either because, for reasons, I had never told my parents what I was doing. The only option I had was to crawl. So crawl I did. It was easily 100 yards of crawl through hard frozen, uneven fields with the remaining stalks of, I want to say but I'm not sure, corn after harvest. Ever inch was excruciating. I was about halfway through the crawl when I saw the coyotes. First one. Then two. They kept a good distance but were clearly curious. I remembered what my grandpa said about wild animals. They don't want to fight. They just want dinner. I couldn't be big so I decided to be noisy. Every pull forward I would growl loudly and this kept them at bay. By the time I got to the driveway, it was fully light. I saw my parents' car was gone. They hadn't even realized I didn't get up and leave for school. I crawled the rest of the way to the house. Somehow got the door open. Crawled into the kitchen. Used the broom to knock the phone down and called 911. I woke up at least a day later in the hospital. My ankle was held together with a metal plate and screws. My hip had to be surgically placed back in the socket. My face was black and blue and I have a permanent crease where the stone hit my orbital bone. And my hopes of escaping to the military were gone. Driving down a bum nowhere hill road commonly called the shortcut to the locals. Called that because it went straight up a massive set of hills and straight down. It was carved and made by local people to avoid having to go all the way around which was a solid extra 30 minutes depending on construction, logging, the local gravel slash soil company, etc. Well, this route is about 10 minutes long if you're going the average 50 miles per hour that people usually did, 
but I felt weird about the road that night. It was about 1 p.m., I was heading home from a long trip I spent with some friends, and I was alone. It didn't feel right, I hadn't taken the route much prior to that, but I was tired and didn't want to waste time getting home. So I'm driving down the road at about 30 miles per hour, and I notice a slight orange slash bronze haze coming just above the nearby trees on my left. I figured it was a car, but the road curved to the right at that place and went straight from there so there couldn't be any headlights coming from that direction. I slowed down, thinking maybe someone had gone off the road, but I couldn't see the origin of the lights. Deciding best not to be the curious stupid person in budget horror movies who checks something out alone, I just pulled my handgun from my holster and set it on the center console, just in case. I slowed to a stop as I came up to the curve so I wouldn't move away from the lights. That's when I found out the lights were moving. Ever so slightly at first, then gained some speed, kind of diagonally towards me but would have passed me. That's when I saw it peek through the trees. It's hard to describe outside of miniature electrical sun. The best representation I've seen is the electrical anomaly in Metro 2033, imagine that but orange and more fury slash plasma why than electrical. It moved through the trees, and I noticed it would sort of stick an arm out to touch the trees it passed, like a little lightning arm. It would start a little fire whenever it touched something, but seeing as these were all giant live pines and it was a rather wet area, valley between two hills, and fires don't start on live wood easily, the fires would go out pretty quick on their own. Then it struck some dead birch trees. And oh boy did those light up quick. This seemed to give it more energy and it sped up and avoided a couple more trees before smacking straight into a big great oak. It blew up like a grenade and disappeared, and set that side of the oak on fire. I called the fire department because that shit wasn't going out anytime soon. Fast forward a bit, they put it out relatively easily, it hadn't grown much and they had one of those big off-road brush fire trucks. Police came and questioned me, they thought I started the fire, that I committed arson. Mid-question a dude from the FD rolls up and says there's lightning scarring on some of the trees and in the dirt, and that it wasn't arson, and the fire followed a specific path that didn't include a lot of dry stuff. After a confusing hour of back and forth, they chalked it down to a destructive event of ball lightning. That remains my only experience with it, and I'm glad I haven't seen it since, that shit is scary. Behind my house was miles of woods until they chopped it down for a neighborhood. 20 feet behind my house is a steep drop off or a mild cliff into a valley with a creek in it. Very steep on both sides. So this valley has been left as forest in between neighborhoods. When I was little we saw all kinds of wildlife in our yard we stopped seeing turkeys completely and less deer after the new neighborhood. Tons of rabies too until the bigger animals stopped coming around. This is all backstory. I only let one dog out to pee in the backyard on a leash because she can escape anything given time while the other is chained to a runner that runs the length of the yard but she is a good girl and doesn't need supervision. So at night it has always been creepy to walk out to the edge of the woods just so the dog can pee. Last summer my sister and I kept hearing something over the hill and felt like we were being watched. The motion sensor light in our yard was always on by the time went outside too. We both thought we were being paranoid so we didn't tell the other our thoughts. Eventually I broke Dosen and told her we were being watched from over the hill and she said she FSLT the same way. We both agreed the presence felt negative and angry. We started taking the dogs out with bats and knives and pepper spray. We could not figure out what was watching us. Whatever it was got bolder and bolder. We started to hear it more frequently. By the way it sounded we both estimated its size as at least that of a large dog. Sometimes we heard a grunt or two. This only happened at night. The dogs would silently whip their heads towards the sounds and just watch. Normally they bark at that kind of stuff. I was glad though because one dog is 12 and needs a leg brace to walk while the escaping one is a chihuahua mix so if they started a fight they would lose. 
This went on for weeks. It started that we felt like we were being watched in the daytime too. We even started hear sounds at day. We never once thought this presence felt human. There are coyotes in the area. There are bears too but they are so rare they make the news when sighted. Mountain lions are extinct in my area so it was possible that some found their way back to this territory but it was unlikely. One day I'm letting the dogs out but I am not too on guard as daytime visits were still much rarer. Then I hear a large object moving through the brush in a grunt. My stomach drops, that was the closest I ever heard it. I pick up my dog as slowly as possible and start to turn towards the house to evacuate when I catch sight of a herd of five or six deer on the cliff staring me down. They look downright murderous. I have seen deer my whole life but I never saw one look so angry. It had been in the news a year before that a single deer killed someone nearby, they were dumb and didn't respect the deer's space. My house was stalked by a herd of deer for weeks lol. My family throws expired produce out of the back door over the cliff, the yard is shallow and you can make the throw from inside, to avoid compostable materials sitting in a landfill. That's why the deer were hanging out, we had a buffet for them. We stopped that real quick and they only hung around for a few more days. It might sound dumb that we never put this behavior together with the visitor but we had done that our whole lives and forgot about it the moment it was launched over the hill. The end result was pretty funny but the build up was creepy. I used to live in rural Tennessee for a minute. I had a house that was at the end of a two mile long driveway, and my closest neighbor was halfway down said driveway. We weren't close, but we helped each other out here and there when needed. One night, I heard someone driving up the driveway. It was probably 11 PM or so, and nobody lived past me, and I had zero clue who it was. I walked over to my front windows and looked outside. Some dude in an SUV was parked in front of my porch. He sees me in the window, waves, then gets out and comes up to talk to me. I opened my front door, locked the screen, and asked what he needed. Said something about looking for his dog, so I asked who he was and where he lived. This dude looked me in the face and said oh I live just past you, there and pointed to the densely packed trees that surrounded my house told him I hadn't seen his dog, and that I apologized for it. He said okay whatever. His tracker just led me here so I figured you would have seen him. I had not, in fact, seen his dog that apparently had a tracker on it. He turned around and walked back down. I watched him until he got into his car and drove far enough that I couldn't hear his tires anymore. Next day, neighbors came over to collect trash for me, They owned a dump truck and saved me the 40 minute drive to town a lot, and they asked me if I had some dude come to my property last night. Said yeah, they asked if I knew him. Said no. Apparently this dude told my neighbors that he lived at the top of this hill across town. Only thing is, said hill had one house, and it was destroyed by a tornado four years prior. He used the same excuse about his dog, but said it was in their yard. Neighbor had no clue how they got into their yard because they, similarly to me, had a gated yard. I never usually shut mine because it got stuck when you latched it, but my neighbors always had theirs latched along with a no trespassing or I'll shoot sign. Needless to say, I kept my gate latched and bought a master lock for it after. Moved about four months after that. When I grew up, I lived in a neighborhood that had a giant cemetery across from it, and I spent many, many nights drinking and smoking weed in the graveyard. Since this cemetery hadn't had anyone buried in it in over 50 years, no one ever visited and city maintained it. One night I'm doing my normal thing, drinking, smoking, and playing on my phone, and I hear someone say do you like hanging out with a dead young man? and I turn around and see a 60-something black man wearing jeans, a checkered flannel shirt, and a gold cross necklace. And I tell him yeah I do actually, they don't talk much. 
He says you'd be surprised how often they do, and he asks my name. I tell him and ask him his and he says I'm Pastor Troy, my wife is buried here and I'd like to see her. I ask if he'd like his privacy and he said I'm actually leaving, you have a good night young man. And he walks away. When I went home and told my mom that I met a guy named Pastor Troy she looked at me really strange and said are you sure? Pastor Troy died a couple years before you were born son. She asked me what he looked like and after I described him she said that I was really freaking her out because I described the man she knew was dead perfectly. It freaked me out for a while. I was driving home not so long ago from work in the pitch black and my usual route was blocked by a cop car so I turned around and went down a country lane no street lights. I'd crawled out of work so needed to pee but it's only 25 minutes to home it'll be fine. Driving 10 miles an hour down this lane I'd never driven down, ditches either side of a lane through a field straight out of a horror film when my neck starts prickling. Something's watching me and it's close. I ignored it cause I'm 37 and really brave, until I couldn't ignore it anymore, looked out the window into the eyes of the devil that opened its mouth and made a god awful noise. I screamed, nearly wet myself and then realized it was a field full of bloody sheep. Another time in bed around midnight, I heard something rustling around my garden, I lived in a bungalow at the time, so I looked out the window thinking the rabbit had let herself out the hutch until she started thumping at something that had disturbed her. Couldn't see anything for a start then two bright yellow eyes and jaws of death opened at me. I fell off the bed squealing and actually did pee a little that time. It turned out to be one of my jet black cats that had snuck out when I'd gone for my bedtime sick. She wanted to come back in. Animals will be the death of me. Was driving down a windy country road around 4 am in the middle of nowhere to my favorite hunting spot. A bit groggy. As my buddy and I come around the next bend we notice a large bright light in the distance. As we get closer, we notice that it is a large fire and that someone must be burning wood. We continue driving and begin to slow down as we get closer. As we approach we see two people waving us down in the middle of the street. We roll down our windows to hear blood curdling screams and cries for help. We look over and can see the fire clearly now. An old pickup truck had ran off the road and smashed into a tree. The entire cab was engulfed in 12 foot high flames. One of the bystanders screamed there's someone in there. I could see the silhouette of a person in the driver's seat surrounded by smoke and fire being burned alive. The flames were too large to offer any help to the person. To this day the haunting images are burned into my mind and the sound of the cries for help are something I will never forget. By far the scariest thing I have ever witnessed. Rural Ohio. Went to visit a buddy, D, who moved a couple hours away to another shithole town. Had another buddy, B, go with me. D takes B and I to meet a new friend of his. We'll get to his designation in a minute. Dude opens the door, greets us, seems normal for like five seconds he was shirtless but that's pretty common out here then the dude turns around as he waves us in massive swastika tattoo across his entire back colored in with confederate flag colors and patterns it was at this moment b and i locked eyes and we knew what each other was thinking our lives might be in danger so we follow this nazi there it is through the house don't want to be rude. We noticed that the carpet was supposed to be white but it was more of a brown with a slight red tint to it. Place was a bit of a mess. We walked past his bathroom where his 14 year old younger sister, we were all 19, was taking a shit with the door open and attempted to greet us mid shit. At this point B and I were massively uncomfortable and a little creeped out by everything and everyone beneath this roof. Finally we get to the dude's room and it was then when B and I looked at each other, we were both sweating profusely, fear in our eyes. Guns man. Everywhere. 
had to have been at least 30 guns all over his room, stored improperly, noticed a couple with the safeties off. Porn posters all over his walls, and of course some Nazi memorabilia. B called my cell from his pocket, to which I answered pretending it was my sister and I acted as if a family emergency was happening and pretended to be distressed. Said, I was sorry but we needed to get back to town. We agreed to never ever visit D ever again. I don't know if this constitutes as creepy or horrifying but to me it started off creepy and got horrifying later on. I have a lot of creepy stories in the woods off Spain's and near my granddad village, some normal, some paranormal, as the thread is serious I will stick to the normal ones. After a day of hiking I started returning home, almost dark but we have a clear path marked with stones that reflect light as markers, halfway there the foxes had no better thing to do that starting to mate so the woods were cover in what hears like women being murdered. Suddenly everything became quiet which normally indicates that wolves or bears are hunting. I stoke to drink a bit as they tend to avoid peel and even if they see you they don't care most of the time. When suddenly I notice the breath of something almost touching my neck, I was so scared only thinking that I was stupid and I just found the only man eating bear in the country. I slowing turn to see it and stop sewing my back and there I see it, a big adult bear sniffing at me. Thankfully once it stopped sniffing it went back into the dense woods. It was scary as f, I was probably safe as in swimming with sharks, but the creepiest thing is how a 200 kilo being sneaked on me with that ease. We own about 9 acres and the shape is a little odd. It's kind of long and slanty with a ravine and creek in the middle. The house is at the front half and the pastures are at the back. So there's a dirt slash clay slash gravel road through the dense forest, down the ravine, over the creek, and back up to where the horses are. I usually walk, because the more I drive on the road the more maintenance it needs and I'm sort of lazy. The first creepy experience was when I was walking down to feed the horses and it was getting close to dusk. I was by myself, but the forest was pretty quiet and peaceful. I sneezed and in a thicket to my left something made a similar noise, but it was not human. It was a deeper pitched, snortier sneeze sound. I didn't like that at all at the time, but I assume now I startled a deer or something. The other time I was walking in the same area with my husband, but it was night time. At night it gets super dark being a rural forest, so we had flashlights. As we're walking along and talking we hear the weirdest noise way up in the tops of the tulip poplars above our heads. It sounded like some strange monkey laughing, but deeper and slower than any monkey I've heard. You could also hear the sound of something big jumping from branch to branch. We tried shining the flashlights up there, but we couldn't see that high in the trees. We left pretty quick and have never heard it again. I tell myself that we startled a flock of wild turkeys, but that was definitely the creepiest experience. I'm not from a super rural part of my country, but it's still just villages with a few dozen houses and then like one kilometer stretch of road between them. But I also live on the edge of a big forest. Anyway, me and my cousin were about 16 to 18 and we were just standing on the road in front of my house. It was like 3 AM, and it was winter. We were just going home from God knows where, and my house was first up, so we usually chatted for a while before I went in. Also important here, we were stone cold sober. Suddenly, there is this weird sound in the distance, which was even weirder since snow usually deadens all sounds. It was like this high-pitched regular beating thing. Kinda like a seagull cry, but regular, like unnaturally regular, like a squeaky car or drill bit. And it started coming closer and closer, but not directly at us. It was getting louder and louder, to the point of being almost uncomfortably loud. It sounded like it flew above my house, about 50 meters away from us, and then it started moving away until it just faded out. We couldn't see anything, 
Because while there are street lights there, they are the kind that reduce light pollution, so basically everything behind the light is like a black wall. Now we were pretty freaked out, and I told him he can crash at my place, since he had a 20 minutes walk ahead of him. He didn't want to, but we still stood there and just nervously talked about what it could have been. It could have been a bird, but it's no bird I have ever heard, and it was during pitch black night during the winter. It couldn't have been a seagull, since we don't live anywhere near water, so even river seagulls don't exist here. And it couldn't have been a hawk, since I know how hawks sound like since they nest right above my house. As we are standing there all weirded out, a car rolls up, and a guy comes out. It's a civilian car, and the guy is like mid-40s. Pulls out a badge, apparently he is a detective at the local police station. Wants to see our ID cards, and writes our info down into his notepad, which I noticed had several people on there, but I couldn't make out anything fast enough. He is acting all shady, asking what we are doing there, and if we saw any weird stuff, and we just say no. Because we were kids and we aren't going to go telling a policeman that we heard an alien robot bird. So he leaves after a while, in the direction of the alien robot bird sound, and after another half an hour my cousin was brave enough to go home, and that was it. It's been over a decade since then, but a few months ago we were talking with friends, and we started reminiscing about this night. Turns out we weren't the only ones to hear it. A few friends that live in the general direction it moved towards also claimed to have heard it, and one said he also got his info taken by the police. Apparently it wasn't a single event as well, and that it went on for a period of time that year, and then it stopped. So we still have absolutely no idea what it was, but the whole situation seems really weird. I like to believe it was an alien robot bird though. I live in rural Mississippi and when my sister lived in Oxford I would visit her frequently. There was always a weird back road I would take to skip over the Natchez Trace Parkway, they loved to give out tickets there, and it was genuinely gross. I'm used to roadkill but there's a stretch of about 3 miles where there's so many dead animals, mostly dogs, it made me ill and so sad. I have no idea why there were so 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 many dead dogs. Large dogs too, mostly pit bulls or hunting dogs. I was always careful on that road because I never wanted to hit any of them. Once I was driving and saw what I thought was a big black dog about to cross the road, so I came to an almost complete stop to let him pass safely. But I immediately felt weird because he wasn't just black, he was matte black, like I couldn't see any features or sun shining on him. It was like he was made of a black hole. When he stepped up from the grass onto the road I realized his legs were far too long and skinny for a dog, and so was his neck, and he was just too tall to be a dog, but his head was very dog-like, like a mastiff. He wasn't too far away from my car but he still felt blurry like he was too far away to see, and it was the middle of the day but there wasn't an ounce of light bouncing off of him. He crossed the road with huge strides, like three steps to cross the two-lane road, and disappeared into the woods. I saw it a few times after that as well, on different occasions, but on those occasions it would just appear in the tree line and duck back in. Very weird area. We were off-roading a couple of years up near the Canadian border, followed some power lines for a ways, when we decided to stop and check out a giant bird's nest atop one of the junctions. Heard a noise behind us and noticed a group of ATV riders on the next hill behind us. Not unusual for that area, what was unusual was the guns strapped to their backs, not hunting rifles, machine gun style and they were staring back with binoculars. We jump back in the jeep and start to head back to our family cabin, check back and yes they are following us and trying to catch up. The kid driving just nails it, our cell phones are useless up here, we have no protection, we only have speed on our side. 
We sped down dirt roads that have never been maintained and somehow managed to get the Jeep parked far enough in our driveway and pull enough brush in front to cover it and hit ourselves. When they roared past we noticed they were all dressed in green, covered in weird insignia patches that we didn't recognize and carrying guns like they were ready for some intense combat, no idea what they were doing or training for. I used to live on 15 acres in the country with my husband and children. We lived at the end of a private gravel road and had a long, winding, gravel driveway. Around 10 PM I'm getting ready for bed and I hear a car coming down the road. I go get my husband and we both start listening. It sounds like the car stopped, but we start to hear the gravel crunching. Someone is walking up our driveway. We are not expecting anyone and certainly not on foot. At this point we head into the garage and since it's pitch black outside, we can't see shit. My husband calls out to the person, but they don't respond. The crunching noise is getting louder as the person gets closer. My husband calls out again and still no response. Just the sound of boots on the rocks. I find our big spotlight and my husband shines it down the driveway. Finally the man rounds the corner and comes into view. It was an UPS man delivering a package. My friend and I were driving across a rural stretch of highway with very little traffic at night. We were having an involved conversation while he drove. Suddenly I saw something extremely large looming in the distance, right in the middle of the road. It too dark to make out but looked like a huge boulder or round object, at least 10 feet high and just as wide. I screamed and pointed at it, my friend hit the brakes and swerved hard around, thankfully missing it. No other cars were around and as it was a one way, we could not turn around to investigate. My first thought was a giant boulder but we were in flat desert, nowhere near a mountain or hills. We called the cops to let them know but about shit our pants. I'm from New Hampshire so fairly used to wilderness, I went to Canada just north of Minnesota to camp and hike with some friends. However, one of my friends became very sick. Not sure why but I decided I would stay behind for the one to two days it would take them to bring him to get cared for. After they left I pretty quickly began to get a little uneasy and had this odd feeling as it got dark, hard to explain but I felt very uneasy, I chalked it up to the weird weather and odd silence of the day, it was very humid and everything felt still, and it was cloudy so it got dark quickly. Anyway, I started a fire and am used to being on my own so once it got dark I felt fine. It was pretty late by the time I decided to head into the tent, now, one thing about tents is you can hear everything. And I heard what sounded like footsteps, maybe like 40 to 50 feet away. I assumed it was a bear looking for scraps and it would move on. I had nothing in the tent and am not particularly scared of bears. I continued to hear footsteps and it soon became clear that uh, there was more than one thing and B. It definitely wasn't a bear. Bears tend to breathe loudly and sniff and make a lot of noise. This was a sneaky sound that would wander and come back, each time making the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I cracked the tent and looked out but it was so dark, eventually I was like F it and grabbed the .45 and a flashlight and opened the tent door and lit the place up with light to find like 8 huge grey wolves staring at me. And that was just what I could see, 3 right in front of me and at least 4 to 5 pairs of eyes further out. Again. I'm not particularly scared of wolves either, but I was alone, had nowhere for protection like a car or trailer, and was in literally the middle of nowhere. It also wasn't that late maybe like 1.30 am. So it wasn't going to get light out for at least 2 hours. I just stood there and looked at them to see what their body language told me. And it looked like they were on the hunt. If I didn't have my gun I have no idea what I would have done. Even then if they wanted me dead my gun would have done little. I always thought that wolves were the size of like big dogs or huskies but they are anatomically built different, like way bigger. One of them would have murked me let alone all of them. 
I just curled up in my sleeping bag with my .45 and all the magazines I had, put my buck knife on my ankle and sat wide awake until the sun came up. Then I started a fire and went about business as usual. I will never camp alone, I suggest all y'all do the same. I'm from Australia and have never heard a sound like that made by a puma or cougar, whatever is native to the area of McCall, Idaho. I was there visiting a friend's family and was invited to help scoot some deer out of some crops around 1 am on a beautiful moonlit night when this incredibly distressing scream just shredded the calm. Imagine the sound of a woman being tortured to death and this is what I was trying to process before anyone told me what it was. It was the single most unnerving experience of my life and still gives me the creeps even as I type this. Nothing could convince me that the sound I was enduring wasn't anything but an unfortunate human suffering unspeakable pain. When I was told we were leaving because there was a cougar slash puma in the immediate area, I was first one on the back of that pickup FFS. I won't lie, I did not sleep a wink that night because I could still hear it moaning slash screaming on for at least another hour. I know the family were pretty amused by my reaction but to put things in context we had been for a walk that morning and they showed me some bare claw marks on a tree. About 15 feet up a tree. So if anything had primed me to be shit scared of things that can slash will kill you in North America, that was it and that night in the fields was the creepiest and most disturbing experience I've ever had. For context, I am from Missouri, specifically a more rural area of smaller towns about 45 to 50 minutes from St. Louis. Anyway, my grandfather owned a property that he originally used for hunting and camping somewhere in the Mark Twain National Forest, about an hour and a half or so away. When my grandfather was alive he would often take me down here for camping trips and such. I was a child at the time. One particular trip me and my grandfather had arrived by our lonesome and planned to stay one night and the rest of my family was going to come down the next day. By the time we got to the property, it was late in the evening so all we did was set up in tent and go to sleep. A bit of time later after settling down, I found myself waking up in the middle of the night. Now our tent was stationed directly across from the ruins of the old hunting cabin that my grandfather had built, it had burnt down some years before this. I woke up with a strange eerie feeling like something was watching me, then from the slightly open flap in the tent, I saw a pair of what appeared to be glowing yellow eyes staring at me from the ruins of the cabin. I woke my grandfather up, but he ignored me and told me to go to sleep. I kept staring at these apparent eyes for what seemed like hours until I finally passed out. I awoke the next morning and looking around the area of the cabin, but saw nothing that could reflect light or anything like that, I only saw a large pair of paw prints in the ash of the cabin. I was once in a farm, sleeping in this camping tent with my best friend. He wakes me up and goes bro I have to pee, but we were far from the house, like mid forest. I say just pee on the grass or whatever and he answers look at the fire pit, we'd made one before gone sleeping. I look and there are two gigantic creepy shadows being projected on the tent. We panic, but we calm each other to sleep. An hour or so later he wakes me up again and he's crying, saying bro I'm gonna die I can't hold my pee. The shadows are still out there, they're like 7 feet tall, maybe my 12 year old mind exaggerated that. We cry ourselves to sleep again but he's almost pissing himself. 20 minutes later we're awake again because he obviously couldn't hold it. The shadows are gone. We get out of the tent and he wants to go to the house to pee. It's a mile away but he'd already pissed his pants a little so that gave us a little more time. We walk through this forest with a souvenir flashlight for minutes, just years later I realize how stupid and lucky we were, there were like 6 snakes per inch there, but we made it to the house. We are getting close when we look the opposite way, there's a soccer field and there they were, 
the same two giant scary shadows wandering around at 3 am, why not? We sprint full speed to the house, enter the bathroom together and start panicking again. He can't hold the pee, I just turn around and he pees as quiet as possible. He gets up, we hug, he didn't wash his hands to be quiet, pretty gross now I see, and try not to cry but we hear footsteps out the house. The door knocks. We are shivering but quiet. Not a single word or sound. Who's in there? Says the voice out the door. We hear a key, it's turning the lock, it unlocks the door. We are crying, hugging as hard as we can, praying, and the door opens. It's the house's owner, his uncle, we were so panicked we forgot he was there. We tell him everything, we cry, we stutter and sob, but we ask him to go outside. He sighs and says fine. When he opened the door we got in shock cause he looked surprised. The surprise expression slowly turns into laughing face as he was realizing something, it was really creepy. We ask what's up. He goes the horses broke the fence and escaped. We go with him, take a look and there were two horses in front of the house. They were his uncles. We laugh nervously and sleep in the house. Biggest oof in my life. I lived in a really small town with nothing to do, but there was a bicycling slash walking trail that the state had set up on an old railway. In total I think the trail was about 40 miles long, but my friends and I would occasionally walk out 2 to 3 miles to enjoy nature or explore, whatever. One day when I was around 10 to 11 a friend and I, both girls, were walking the trail and we heard a weird banging noise. We also thought we heard a kid crying but it sounded more muffled than the banging noise. Curious and concerned, we quietly went to the edge to investigate while staying hidden in the trees and bushes. We saw a man with no shirt swinging a bat against an crate, occasionally letting out a loud scream as he attacked the box. For a few minutes my friend and I were just watching and trying to make sense of what might be going on, but before we could figure anything out he spotted us. As soon as he turned around to look our direction we froze, but when he started walking towards us we ran. At first we just started ahead on the trail a little ways thinking he would turn around when he saw us leave, but he didn't. The scariest memory of my childhood is stopping to look back and seeing this stranger walking quickly towards us, bat still in hand, and knowing we were completely alone for miles in any direction. We both sprinted further down the trail panicking and unsure of what to do. We were actually running away from town, but there was no chance to turn back because the man was always still coming when we slowed down even a little. He followed us for at least a mile before we caught sight of the highway through the trees and made a break for it. We made it to the road and walked along it back to our town without seeing him again, but we were both scared out of our minds. When we got back we both explained what happened to my grandma thinking we should call the police but she completely brushed us off thinking we were just scaring ourselves over nothing. Now I'm an adult and I definitely would have called the cops if my kids told me this story. I never heard anything more about the guy and we definitely never went that far on the trail alone again. I'm still haunted by the sound of the kid crying we heard, not sure if it came from the grown man, or the crate. My town isn't as rural as it used to be so I'm not sure if I still count but years ago I used to be a driver's mate for a plant pot company. We traveled all over the UK but this happened about 3 to 4 miles outside of my hometown. All over the UK there are rumors that there are large prey cats still living in the wild. I'd always taken these as the fantasies of bored people. Then one day we had just left our warehouse, heading up the A20, between Charing and Lenham, on our way to the motorway to start heading to Wales and we saw a bloody great big black cat, we watched it for a good 15 minutes. It was walking past sheep, it was quite a bit larger than them. Then it stopped walking and sat down, it looked straight at us and then ran off, and it was gone. If I had been alone I would have chalked this up to my being tired or something but aid, the driver, saw exactly the same thing as me. 
That whole three day trip we both felt like we were being watched. Freaked us both out. It was a few months before we used the A20 again. I was camping by myself in a big open area in Colorado a few years back, Taylor Rees area if you're familiar. This area is all open grassy ranch land and I remember that I could see cows way off in the distance maybe two or three miles away. It was that kind of wide open space. That night was pretty quiet and as I was laying there in my tent drifting off, I thought I heard a slow footfall crunching in the gravel nearby. I waited quietly listening for a few minutes. About the time that I started to believe that it might have been a dream, I hear it again, but now was very slow, almost methodical, like a person trying to walk quietly one slow step at a time. This sound sounded close, like maybe it was no more than five or six feet from my tent. Not knowing what was going on or what to expect, I remember reaching out quietly and putting my hand on my pistol. I was starting to get a little freaked out. Maybe a minute later, I heard it again. This time it sounded like it might be right outside my tent, maybe only a foot or two away from my head. I laid there as quiet as I could possibly be with my heart racing just listening for any sound. Wondering if I'm going to have to defend myself or what. The silence seemed to go on forever. Then suddenly, without warning, I hear the most blood-curdling primal animal sound from right next to my head. It's hard to describe the panic of what raced through my mind in that instant, I instantly knew no human made that sound. Whatever it was was huge. It was like a combination of a dinosaur and a horn from a freight train. And it was like 10 inches from me with nothing between us but tent fabric. It felt like I jumped a foot in the air and sat bolt upright in my tent. I'm glad I didn't have a finger on the trigger or I probably would have squeezed off a round accidentally. In the eternity of the next few moments that passed after that sound, while I was sitting up and still processing the shock of what just happened, eyes as big as saucers as my adrenaline spiked, I heard a similar sound from way off in the distance. And then another from even farther away. My brain went on a quick wild ride like, F you. Get out. And so that's how I learned that cows in a big range like that still moo to each other, but I guess to be heard across such distances, they basically have to scream at each other. Summer 1997, I was 15 years old. My dad had recently remarried, sold his house, and moved in with his new wife who lived in rural eastern Idaho. I usually spent summers with my dad so I decided to move up to her house for the summer. I didn't really know anyone in the area except my stepmom's nephew, who was a year younger than me, so if I wasn't hanging out with him, I was playing N64, watching a movie, or jumping on the trampoline etc. She kept her trampoline in the front yard, I loved that thing. Spent hours on it perfecting my backflips and tricks and pretend WWE with my step cousin. I also spent a few cold-ass rural Idaho summer nights on that thing buried in my sleeping bag trying to tough out the cold. There were a few houses around us but most of the area was just farmland and trees. Directly across the street from her house was an irrigation canal, maybe 20 feet wide, fairly deep, and beyond that was a massive field with those giant hay bales in it, and about a half mile beyond the field was a large tree line. This was around late June, Friday afternoon. I'm the only one home, my dad managed a music store but he was also a musician and would often play gigs, which is where he was tonight. Stepmom was out with stepsister, probably in town. The sun is getting ready to set, I'm out on the trampoline just sitting, enjoying the cool air. I'm facing the field across the street when I see something come out from the tree line at the end of the field. It looked like a big ass wolf, holy shit. I jump off the tramp and walk to our property line to look at it better. Judging from my distance I would estimate its back to be about 4 feet tall, maybe more. It's just walking around when all of a sudden it looks towards me and just stops, it's staring at me now, the hairs on the back of my neck raise up, I've never felt anything like this. 
I know I should probably run into the house but I can't stop watching this wolf. All of a sudden, this thing stands up on its hind legs to get a better look at me. I about soil myself right there. I ran into the house and looked back out the window for it, but it was gone. I locked my doors and waited in fear for my stepmom to finally come home. The only person I immediately told was my older brother the next day, who wanted to go into the tree line to look for it. Nope. I never slept outside on the trampoline again. I spent most of the summer there and never saw the wolf again. Around 12 years ago, was working at a mine around 60 kilometers away from the town I lived in at the time. I had to make this 60 kilometers drive every day and because the location is very remote, there is literally nothing between my town and the next town over where the mine is located. Well, one morning the night shift crew I was on got let out of a shift early so I headed back home at around 2 am in the morning. The weather was wild that night, it was windy as hell, and pissing with rain, so it was like whipping into my car super hard on the way home. The 60 km stretch of road between work and home is as I said, very remote, there's not a single man-made building or structure all the way except for some very large power line set back into the bush. The sides roads are thickly lined with dense green brush and trees that are heaving going to walk through. But around halfway back along that road there is around a 2 km stretch of road where the edges of the road are lined with quite short brush, sort of like plains, that go back around 100 meters before the vegetation becomes dense again. Well, it's around 2.30 am and I'm just hitting that stretch of road and as I said, it's dark, really dark and wild rain is pelting down getting blown around by the wind etc and i round a corner that takes me right into the middle of that stretch of plain and my headlights shine across it and standing there around 80 meters back almost right against where the brush gets thick and turns into trees again there is a man standing there roughly 25 kilometers into the middle of nowhere in the pitch dark and a wild storm it looked like he was wearing dark trousers some sort of coat or thick jacket and some sort of hat or cap. I looked right at the guy, he was too far away to see like eyes, but I could plainly see a man. He didn't move at all, and quickly faded out of view as my lights turn away from him. I had the wildest shot of adrenaline surge through me at that moment, I thought I was going to wreck my car. Like, WTF was he doing out there? Was he stuck? There were no vehicles anywhere on the sides of the road on the way and he was not near any side tracks. All I know is, I didn't stop or turn back. I sat right up at my steering wheel almost leaning over it and drove home the rest of the way rather quickly. I never told anyone but my wife because I thought they'd all reckon I was a kook or laugh about it. I'd always try to avoid driving through there late at night after that night and the only couple of times I did, I literally put my interior light on and didn't dare look out to the sides of the road. I can't explain to this day why that man was out there, or what he was doing but yeah, I don't ever drive through there at night at all anymore. My dad's backyard adjoins a giant gravel pit. When I was teenager, a few friends and I decided to walk over and explore it. It was supposed to be closed for the day, so it should have been a giant red flag when we saw a random old guy walking around and talking to himself. It's unlikely that he came from nearby, as the gravel pit is a good 10 minute drive from the city. Out of curiosity, we asked him how he was doing, and he told us that he was looking for gold. We don't have that anywhere near here. He talked to us about wolves getting too close to him and how he was trying to track the footprints. They were fox-sized at best, he walked off and started mumbling about how the Blue Jays were his favorite hockey team, and that's around when we noped out. We glanced back to make sure that he wasn't following us, and we saw him pull out a handgun and start polishing it. We sprinted towards an attached brush area to hide out because we didn't want to lead him to my dad's house. We called the police out of concern, but they couldn't find him. It was spooky at the time, but due to his thick accent, 
we are pretty sure that he might have just been a confused foreigner who was trying to live off the land. I still think about him from time to time and hope that he's okay. My parents live in Bayou country. House surrounded on three sides by wood slash small bayou. Lots of wildlife, very few people. When I was growing up almost no one lived there. One day, I'm home visiting with my husband and our toddler daughter, and we decided to go for a walk and my dad decides to join us. We left my mom at home with some other family who were visiting, didn't bother to tell her we were going since we didn't plan on going far. About five minutes into our walk, I hear my mother's voice faintly calling my daughter's name. In the country, sound carries a lot further than you'd think, so I wasn't surprised I could hear her. My dad stopped walking and said better call your mom and tell her the baby is with us before she freaks out. So I borrowed his cell phone, I had left mine at home, and called her. The first few calls didn't go through so we started walking back, I'm starting to get nervous because my mom is probably freaking out thinking she lost my daughter or something. I finally reach her on the phone and tell her, breathlessly, that I had my little girl. She's confused. What are you talking about? I explain we went for a walk but heard her calling my daughter's name and didn't want her to worry. Dead silence. Then I've been inside. I never called her name. I never even looked for her, I assumed you had her. I know I heard my mom's voice. It was very clear, and so was my daughter's name. My dad heard it too. When I asked my husband, he said he had heard a voice calling our daughter's name but couldn't swear it was my mom. So weird, and not the only strange thing to happen back there but definitely the one of the creepiest. I was camping in upstate New York, middle of absolutely nowhere. There were six of us, three guys and three girls. Long after it got dark, and it gets really dark up there, great for stargazing, we were ready to pack it in and head to bed. Us girls decided to take the 10 to 15 minute walk to a small wash basin on the property to wash up slash brush teeth before bed, meanwhile the boys stayed behind to poke at the fire. I held the large flashlight to guide our way there, swinging it a little as I walked. We did our business, all while laughing and having a good time. Then it was time to head back to the tents. About halfway is a large clearing, with more forest on either side. We come to the edge of the field, and cut straight through to the other side. About halfway through the field, I swung the flashlight upwards, and that's when we saw it. A group of people, standing in a circle, all holding hands, in the pitch black darkness. They all looked like normal people in normal clothes, but they all just stared at us. It was almost as though they've been staring at us the entire time, I don't remember seeing their heads actually turning. They didn't say a word. I held the flashlight on them for a few seconds as I froze. Then the three of us started speed walking, as if to pretend this weren't actually happening. As soon as the group was behind us, we broke out into a sprint and ran the rest of the way back. Who the F were they? They weren't there on the way to the wash basin, why were they there on the way back? Where did they come from? Were they watching us? Why didn't they say anything? Not even a hi? Would that make them more terrifying or less? Are they a witch coven? A cult? We had so many questions and still no answers. Obviously the boys thought we were a little crazy, over-exaggerating, or even making it up. But we know what we saw. I'm still friends with the girl who brought us out there, and we find sanity with each other. We know we're not crazy. It's the closest thing to a ghost story I've ever experienced. Here in North Texas, a cryptid known as the Lake Worth Monster or the Greer Island Goatman is said to roam Greer Island and the surrounding area near Lake Worth. Although this story doesn't take place at the lake, it takes place by another close lake, I'm not going to share this specific lake for privacy reasons. Anyways when we were kids, my cousin, 
8 meters, lived by this lake my sister, 10 F, and I, 12 meters, as well as his other cousin, 13 meters, were invited over for the weekend. When we were over we heard strange noises during the night, similar to an elk bugle, this was the loudest when my uncle drove us through the woodland on the shore. One night when staying up playing Animal Crossing, about 2012, New Leaf had just released, we heard these noises and looked out the window to see a grey hairy humanoid figure with horns and hooves standing on his neighbor's roof. Needless to say, this was the most terrified I had ever been. After this we just hid in his room closed all windows and blinds then made a fort so we felt safer. We didn't get our aunt and uncle though because he had a baby brother that we did not want to disturb. After all, we thought the crying would attract it. I wouldn't say creepy but it was weird. When I was about 6 to 7 it was a clear still day on the farm and I was outside with my auntie. We could hear this noise that at first sounded like the wind was rushing towards us. The farm that I lived on is in a big valley surrounded by mountains and we were looking up towards the mountain and we can see the trees bending towards us and we can hear this screaming noise getting louder and louder. My auntie was getting freaked out because it was weird and I asked her what her what it was and she said maybe a windstorm? Out of nowhere this Air Force jet flies up over the mountain and then down right over the top of us and across the valley and over the other mountain. We threw ourselves on the ground because the noise was so loud and it was flying so low it scared the shit out of us. This happened in the early 90s. Air Force jets are no longer allowed to fly that low or at that speed over land. Although that was the only time I ever saw one do that on the farm so I kind of think that maybe they were being a bit dodgy to begin with. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.